final nails in the coffin here. And Luis Salvato forces a playoff with Seth Manfield for player of the year by getting himself into the top eight. Hello everyone, welcome to Atlanta, Georgia. Rich Hagen alongside Maria Bartholdi and Eduardo Sanjgalic. We're gonna start you off right with bonus magic and it is the highest, highest level we could find. When the first pro tour of the season just isn't enough, let's kick things off with the player of the year playoff between Seth Manfield and Luis Salvato. Wherever you are around the world on your Thursday, I think it's Thursday pretty much everywhere, Thanks for being with us. We can't wait to bring you all the action. So, Maria, what are you looking forward to today? Never mind the Pro Tour. What about this right. playoff? Right. I know. It's really cool to kick things off with this, Rich. And, you know, it's a really unique format that the players are going to be playing. And I hear there are one or two aggro decks in the field, and I'm really looking forward to seeing that. You're really looking forward to that turn four kill? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Eduardo, what about you, my friend? I want to see how they navigate the best of one format, the specialty of all Magic Arena players. But in truth, it's trying to figure out how can I counter, because you know, there's only two people, so you have to play the other human being much more than in any normal format, right? Mm -hmm. What should I bring to the table considering what I know about the other person? Sure, well, we do have an extraordinary unique format for this extraordinary unique event. Let's walk you through all the rules and regulations for how this player of the year tie is going to be separated. Maria, walk us through the start. All right, so first of all, this is a best of seven playoff, okay? So that's already unique, and it's a one game match format and if you're an arena player you're already kind of familiar for this mm -hmm. uh, so Seth and Luis will select one of their four submitted standard decks to battle and they're each gonna choose them independently of each other and once they've made that decision their choices are revealed to both players and then they'll have access to each other's deck lists. okay so that's part one when we head down to the feature match area we'll see the first deck for each player so one of the things we want to make sure is that we have as little variance as possible to this. So we're going to give the players a free mulligan. Oh, so that's that nice of you, Rich. It, 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 we thought that was kind. <laughs> so if you don't like your opening seven, normally you would go straight down to six. In this format, you get to take a fresh seven before you start mulliganing and scrying. And yes, if you take your free mulligan, you do not get to scry then. Scrying happens once you're down to six cards. Now, as soon as you win a match with your standard deck that you've chosen, that's the end. That deck gets retired from the rest of the playoff because however good the deck is, it will only win one game, that is certain. So at that point, you then go to your next deck in the queue and you decide of the three remaining decks if you're one nil up what you want to play. And if you lost your first match, well, then you have to decide, do I want to stick with this deck or move on to one of my other three? Eventually, though, you will have to win with all four of your decks. You must win one game with each of the four. If we get to three each, we'll know exactly what that final game is going to look like. So four is the magic number here. All right, so Maria, we've got on screen now the player of the year winners and what an absolute avalanche of talent. Oh it, yeah, it, you wanna be there. in this club, <laughs> absolutely. So obviously you've got the greatest players of all time here. You've got John Finkel, you've got Kai Buda, the great one, Bob Ma, the Japanese dominance of the years 2005 to 2011. And then that 2010 player, Brad Nelson, Eduardo, that's there because of the first ever playoff. Yeah, I mean, I was there. I was in the room. Like, I, back then, uh, playing a Grand Prix in, uh, you know, what was essentially my hometown in Paris. And I just like, but, okay, I, I'm in the UK, but I'm going back to my hometown to check it out. And there was a Grand Prix and a Pro Tour in the same room. It's perfectly Why reasonable. Not? <laughs> perfectly <laughs> yeah. reasonable. All right, so let's find out who is going to join that incredible list. We're going to start with Seth Manfield. There you see him. He's a Platinum Pro from Team KMC Genesis. 16 Grand Prix Top 8s, 4 Pro Tour Top 8s. He's the champion of Pro Tour Ixalan. How did he do this season? How did he accumulate his 81 points? Let's look at his Pro Tour session. Of course, the standout is Pro Tour Ixalan, the big 3-0, 30 points for winning Pro Tour Ixalan. And then his six best Grand Prix finishes, if we take a look at those for you, and you will see he's done tremendously well. Bear in mind, six points is a final, five points is a semi-final, so he has relentlessly made the top eight of Grand Prix this season, ending up with 81 points. Now, right this minute, he's down on the floor getting ready for the playoff. But about 30 minutes ago, he was in the company of our very own Brian David Marshall. 
I'm here with, for just a couple more hours, Hall of Famer elect Seth Manfield. Seth, Player of the Year playoff is coming up. What, what have these last couple months been like for you from the end of Pro Tour 25th anniversary to, to now? This has been just a crazy couple of months for you. It really has. Going into the the Pro Tour 25th anniversary, I think I was like second in the player of the year race. And I was just focused on doing well at that Pro Tour. Wasn't thinking about the race. And then afterwards I was like, oh, what now? Like there's like three people that can still win this player of the year race. And there's like a handful of Grand Prix left. And I, I just wanted to know like, am I, am I gonna be the player of the year? And, it, and Luis ended up ha having a great top eight right at the end to tie me. And then it was like, wait, what, what happens when two players tie for player of the year? Has that ever happened in the history of the game? It turns out that once it has happened back in, I think, 2011. When yeah, 2010 season 2010. played out in 2011. Yeah. Brad Nelson, someone who could give you some firsthand uh, information. Did, did Brad give you any kind of like advice about how to approach this kind of event? He gave me some, he gave me some thoughts for sure. He's, he's the standard guru of our testing team. And considering we're playing four standard deck lists for the playoff, uh, he's certainly someone who I was listening to. And then a lot of us were wondering, hey, what, what are they going to do for the formats? That was a big question mark. And an exciting way of doing it is to have four different decks play, playing head to head against Luis and seeing how they match up against each other, not playing with cyborgs, having free mulligans. These are all things that we haven't really seen before. So it should be interesting to see how this plays out. Let me ask you about that free mulligan idea. Um, is that something that you guys thought about in terms of your mana base? Is there any opportunity to play around with Deckless a little, knowing you have that free mulligan? We definitely th thought about all of all of the constraints with the deck building, and if you're able to to rely on one specific card, you can just if you're playing four of them with the free mulligan, you're much more likely to find it. If, you're not, if it's not in your original seven, you can mulligan again and again. And so, for instance, say you're playing a, a mono blue aggro deck, which, which you, might, might, you might want for this format because one of the best cards in it is Curious Obsession. So you might want to mulligan to your Curious Obsession. Um, so there's def different variables like that we definitely thought about, yeah. All right, it's a very busy weekend for Seth. He's got to suit up. He's going to be in the Hall of Fame. He's got to play this playoff. And then he's still got a whole Pro Tour to play in. Uh, I bet you have never been more ready for round one of a Pro Tour in your life. Uh, those are your words, Brian. Those are not, that's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, I, I'm always nervous going into a Pro Tour. I am going to be happy just to kind of get, get going. I want... I kind of am ready to get the, the this playoff started because I'm nervous. I know it's going to be, it could be fast, could be a lot of aggro decks, you know, playing off against each other. And so knowing what happens is going to be, it's going to kind of shape the rest of my weekend for sure. All right. Well, good games the rest of the way, Seth Manfield, your potential player of the year and Hall of Famer elect. All right, well, let's meet who Seth Manfield is playing against, and that is none other than Luis Salvato of Argentina, a platinum pro on Team Series team Hara Ruya Latin, an excellent team there. Two Pro Tour top eights, including a win, of course, at Rivals of Ixalan this year, playing Lantern Control. Some may call him a monster, some may call him a hero. Seven Grand Prix top eights. Let's take a look at how he got those 81 points. All right, there you see it. The big 3-0, as Rich mentioned, that's for a win there at Rivals of Ixalan earlier this year, 13 points too at Pro Tour 25th anniversary, which is very, very good. Let's take a look at his Grand Prix season because he racked up some points here, of course, are his top six finishes, Grand Prix Santiago. There was a win with the Team GP, and he tied it all up at Grand Prix Stockholm earlier this year. Well, BDM is, I talked to him earlier this morning to find out how he was feeling before the tournament. I got a little chance to talk to him too. He said the format sounded really fun. Let's see what he had to say. I'm here with Player of the Year hopeful <laughs> Luis Salvato currently has a co-share of the Player of the Year lead. And Luis, I got to tell you, my favorite moment from the previous Pro Tour season is probably your enter the battlefield <laughs> with Nate and Sean, where in the middle of the shoot, you're like, sorry, guys, I got to pack a bag. I got to get out of here. I've got a Player of the Year title to chase. What was that like? Yeah, well, it was true. I was out of home like one month, then come back for three days, and I then start to travel again for 50 days. 
But at the end, I, I almost uh, got the title, but I'm here, so it's worth it a lot. What, what was that uh, feeling when you realized that you'd put in all this travel and all this time and that you were, in fact, still alive for the Player of the Year title? How, how did that feel at that moment at that GP? Well, it was like a, a lot of emotions together, like because at one time I didn't know that I was a real contender for the Player of the Year. Then I realized that I had like multiple um, slots from GP, so I said, well, this is kind of easy if I play a lot. But then I started to stumble like 10 and 5, 10 and 5, and then Seth made a top 8, and I say, oh, it's, it's, going, <laughs> it's going far. But then he say, okay, I need to go to Stockholm. I have my blue white modern deck, and I will play that tournament. And I made it, and I top 8, and it was, okay, this is insane. And it felt like really good because. So now, f fast forward a little bit, you're on the eve of this Player of the Year playoff. H how did you sleep last night? How was that for you? It was not easy. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, because I have like, uh, I, I, I know how to sleep well. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my skills. But it's one of the few things I do as well as Luis. <laughs> At one time I woke up like 7 a.m. like thinking about the playoff and kind of dreaming and I'm nervous and I say, wait, you are sleeping, try to <laughs> relax. And then I continue sleeping and it was good. But at one point my head like tried to like send me a lot of information and I say, wait, wait, stop, relax. And of course I'm nervous and excited because it's a, it's a lot of games against a good player for a lot of things, but I am okay now, yeah. One of the things I love about the build up to this event is you and Seth have become quite close in, in this competition. You guys are going to be playing together at yes. a GP later this year. Yes, yes. This is like, it was like a like casual thing because I was about to play with Carlos Romao and then he dropped from the, from the team because he has a, a Comic Con in Brazil. Oh, nice. And at the same time, Seth tweeted that he wants to play Liverpool and Carlos said to me, why you just ask Seth if and I say, yes, why not? And I asked Seth and he told me, yes, I'd love to play with you. And then, okay, we will play together. And it's like a good end of story for the, like the Player of the Year competition and then play together. I think it's really good. Well, the actual end of the Player of the Year story is coming up in just a few minutes. Yes. Got to win four <laughs> matches with four decks. Good games the rest of the way here in your pursuit of the title Player of the Year. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, BDM. Really awesome stuff. All right, Eduardo, the big question, who wins? Well, it's been close all year. It's going to end close as well. But, and I have to say, while Seth would be an extremely deserving player of the year, really, Luis winning would mean so much to the whole community in Latin America that, for me, it's Team Luis, but it's going to end up being down to the wire. All right, then. Two players, four decks, four game wins, only one Player of the Year. The Player of the Year playoff between Seth Manfield and Luis Salvato starts now. Welcome to the 2017-2018 Player of the Year playoff live from Pro Tour Guilds of Ravnica. After a huge season that showcased the very best of what professional magic has to offer, two towering figures of the modern era remained in deadlock, unable to clinch ultimate supremacy. But that changes today. Two contenders sit at the table, but only one will rise as the player of the year. Let's meet the contestants. In the red corner, the only Argentinian to ever have been crowned a Pro Tour champion with two Pro Tour top eights and seven Grand Prix top eights, one of them a win. Please welcome Luis Lockdown Salvato. And in the green corner, a Pro Tour champion, a world champion, and in a few short hours, a Hall of Famer as well. Can he add another title to the list? Ladies and gentlemen, it's steamrolling Seth Manfield.
Our contestants are in readiness and we have a player of the year to crown. Let the playoff commence. Welcome to the Future Match area here in Atlanta, Georgia. Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Chion to cover this special Player of the Year playoff between Luis Salvato and Seth Manfield. They are seated. They are ready. And we are ready to go here, Paul. Now, we've got quite a bit to cover here as uh, we're going to be doing a different format here. Give us a quick explanation for the players that haven't seen it as the players are going to pick their decks here. Yeah, so this is an extremely unique... Oh, wait, we're going to see the decks here real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Luis couldn't wait to show us what he was playing for his first deck. He's got Mono Blue Tempo, and it Whoa. looks like we're in a mirror match here, Paul. Both players on the Mono mirror. Blue Tempo, and their deck is presented. Now, what is going on here, though, Paul? Normally, you pick your deck before you come to the tournament. You sit down to play. You don't have a placard that says <laughs> what you're playing. Well, why are they showing us that here? So the format for this tournament is... Both players submit four separate decks, and none of the decks can have more than eight cards that overlap. Um, or you, you can't have more than eight cards overlap. And uh, they, they all have to be different, and it's best of seven. You have to win with every single one of your decks. The moment you win, you can no longer play that deck, and you have to switch. Um, and again, the first to four wins, uh, wins it all. Okay, so what we're going to be seeing here is both players have chosen... His uh, chosen their copies of Mono Blue. Let's take a look at the deck list here as the players get fully prepared here to actually battle. And we can, we can look at the kind of decks, especially uh, we'll be looking here at the Mono Blue Tempo deck, as you can see on your screen. So clean. Look at this list. It is a lot of force. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that you'll see uh, from list to list is, uh, is a tendency towards proactivity. Right. So one of the most important things in this format is you are playing just game once. So decks that are, you know, kind of better post-board, mm -hmm. um, you're not going to see as often. I think a lot of these players, well, the, uh, the both, both of these players have chosen to play decks that are very, very good game one, that have kind of either a very proactive strategy or a very controlling strategy. So regardless, it's pretty linear. Uh, the, 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 you know, part of the strength of a lot of the mid-range decks are the fact that you can have a lot of flexibility in your sideboard. But given that we're only playing best of ones, you're going to see mono blue, maybe some mono red and some mono white. All right, let's take a look at Seth's version of mono blue and see how different it is. Did anything change? <laughs> well, I think the cards moved what place they were in. Right. You know, a card that I did notice uh, that I don't see here was Sleep. There was two copies of Sleep in the, well, I, I should say, in the deck here uh, for Luis Salvato. None here. One of the cards, though, that I want to point out that, of course, both players are playing four of, and it's a reason to play this deck is Curious Obsession. Another rules wrinkle that we should mention here as we're getting ready to start resolving mulligans is it in order to just take a little of the edge off of a one-game match, the players actually get one free mulligan from seven to seven again. Now, you don't get a scry with that mulligan, and then you can continue to if you need to. But uh, I heard the players chatting before, and both of them mentioned Curious Obsession as a card that they were willing to perhaps even mulligan to because the draws that start off with that card uh, are so powerful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this deck kind of sometimes functions as like one of those combo decks where if you do have that start of a one-mana flyer or evasive unblockable creature and follow that up with a Curious Obsession, um, I mean, those are kind of what your best draws entail. And given the fact that you do get this free mulligan, um, you know, you might look for that certain, a specific combination of cards. Um, I even talked to the players and asked them, look, you got a free mulligan to seven. Did you consider shaving a land when you built your decks? Mm. And Seth Bennett Manfield did, in fact, choose to cut a land oh. from one of his decks oh. because he goes, you know what? This deck sometimes floods out. I'm going to cut a land because I get two mulligans to seven. Lots of gamesmanship here in the, uh, in the time leading up to our Player of the Year playoff. Uh, and, of course, this format throwing a lot of curveballs at our players. Also, you know, we got to remember that these players were preparing for the Pro Tour, right? right. We, tomorrow morning we'll be here drafting in Atlanta for Pro Tour Guilds of Ravnica. And so they needed to fit this testing time in with that. I had a quick chat with Luis Salvato beforehand, 
and it was incredible. I he was he seemed shocked by it. He told me he said, "Well, I built these four decks, and then I thought, well, I'll take them for a spin on Magic Online just to take a day to do this and practice." So he played his first league, and he went five zero. He got a trophy with it, which is which is hard to do, right? I mean, five wins is, is pretty tough on the competitive cues on Magic Online, but he did. Then he took the next deck and he five would with that, and then he five would with the other two as well. He went twenty and zero with his decks. Very typical for. And he a said, "Lock it in." The, player of the uh, potential player of the year, just five zero with every deck. I guess so. He seemed surprised by it, and uh, yeah, so just a cool twenty zero for Luis Salvato leading up to this. And uh, he said, "Well, I guess these decks must be good." So right, right, and they go. Uh, what one thing that I will. I would like to note, just on this matchup, most of the cards were nearly identical. Well, one very important card, uh, one of the ver most important cards that uh, Seth has access to in his deck is Exclusion Mage. That mm -hmm. is a way for Seth to interact with Curious Obsession that Luis Salvato doesn't have access to. But on the flip side, Luis does have two copies of Sleep in his deck, which is really, really good in an aggressive mirror because it does buy you time. However, you know, when you're playing against cards like Spell Pierce, it could be a little bit clunky. I see. Four mana could be a little bit tough there. Um, <laughs> perhaps predictably, both players are mulliganing here. Right. You know... So when I, w when you play with this mono blue deck, oftentimes you'll have these really awkward hands with a bunch of dive downs and not a lot of action. Uh -huh. So this deck does want to aggressively mulligan. Some of the types of hands that you're really looking for in this deck is either having the evasive creature early with Curious Obsession or Tempest Gin. Tempest okay. Gin by okay. itself, one of the most powerful cards in the deck, and you can just single-handedly win games with the Tempest Gin because <laughs> all you do is just slam it on turn three, and you know it puts your opponents on a very, very quick clock. Yeah, it grows basically every turn. And the game ends quickly thereafter. Also, of course, evasion, just a, a good late game target for the Curious Obsession, which can be so important. It's That's the kind of runaway draw that you're looking for here, though. This is interesting that the players happen to be in a mirror match where, you know, cards like Dive Down won't have as many targets as they will against, like, a deck with black or red in it. Yeah, I'm actually very curious how these players... See, so this kind of looks like a mulligan to me. You see a bunch of lands. This deck, first of all, plays 20 lands, so four is a lot. And you don't have the Evasive Creature, and you don't have the Tempest Gen. I could definitely see Luis going to six here, despite having a hand with lands and spells. Yeah, that's a, that's a junker. Yeah. Now, Seth Manfield won the die roll before the players sat down. So he gets to decide first, and he keeps. And as you predicted, Paul, Luis is going to say... Nah, send that one back. Now, this does put him down to six cards. He only gets the one free mulligan, but of course, he'll get the scry. Yeah, you do not get the scry on your mulligan to seven, no. if, uh, if you were wondering. But, yeah, again... I asked these players, like, how do you determine what decks do you play? Is there, like, a leveling thing? Or or are you just completely choosing decks at random? And I was trying to put myself in their position and sure. going, what would I do? And I think for the first game, I think for the first game, you just want to choose a deck at random so that you can't be exploitable. Your opponents can't figure out what you're going to play. And you just, if you're playing a game of rock, paper, scissors, and your opponent, and you're just completely randomizing it, your opponent cannot choose a deck to beat that strategy. Mm -hmm. Going with Game Theory Optimal on that yeah, one. Yeah, go, go G full GTO, GTO there. GTO, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at the opening six here for Salvato. And once he gets a hand he likes, we will be underway in our Player of the Year playoffs. Thanks so much for joining us here in Atlanta. This is a special event, something that's only happened a couple times throughout Magic's history. And I, for one, am excited about Ooh, it. Oh, that, that's a hand. That is quite a hand. Luis Salvato... Looks like he only has one land in hand, but he has that combination. He's got an evasive creature with Curious Obsession in his opener. And here we go. Evasive creature down. Siren Storm Tamer hits the battlefield for Luis Salvato. No one drop thus far from Manfield. Yeah, Manfield has a little bit of a slower hand, but, you know, he did have lands and uh, one of the important cards that I mentioned earlier in that Tempest Gin. And he will be able to actually stop the Curious Obsession for one turn uh, because Seth Manfield does have a Merfolk Trickster in hand. So he can use that to flash it in and tap down the creature. Oh, Boy. and he's doing it before Luis even draws. Interesting. So Luis maybe has another place to put that mana rather than playing the Curious Obsession. Seth Manfield, mindful of cards like Dive Down, that could come out of, off the top of the library. It looks like a second copy of Siren Storm Tamer. Uh-oh, things are starting to, to shape up off of this mulligan to six for Luis Salvato. Yeah, however, if Seth Manfield finds land number three and just plays a Tempest Gin, 
It's not like the Curious Obsession is going to allow Luis to be able to attack through. That is correct. The brick wall would be in effect. Let's see if he has it. He gets in with the Merfolk Trickster, so first blood goes to Seth Manfield. Oh, he passes the turn oh, back. Wow. No third land here for Manfield. Yeah, and things are shaping up very ni nicely here for Luis. He has that opt, which can help him dig even deeper. And one nice thing about having multiple copies of Siren Storm Tamer on the battlefield is that he can now protect uh, one of his creatures with Curious Obsession by having access to that Siren Storm Tamer on the battlefield. You can pay a U to sacrifice Siren Storm Tamer to counter target spell or ability that targets you or a creature you control. And I want to also point out that targeting you is very, very important, at least on Seth's side, because you can actually use Siren Storm Tamer to counter sleep. Oh, that's pretty good. That Louis has. <laughs> All right, it's going to be Wizard's Retort here for Seth Manfield to try to counter. Oh, and he's going to Wizard's Retort back. Oh, and this is huge. And bang. In comes the team. Now, this is only three damage, but a card off the top of the library, and it represents a scenario where Seth is going to be desperate to find a way to interact Seth with that Storm Tamer. Yeah, he did. He found one off the top of the library here, Paul. Okay, and that's really big. Now, Luis does need to find a... Oh! It was Exclusion Mage. Plays the Exclusion Mage, returns the Storm Tamer while the shields were down and he stems the bleeding in a major way. That was one of those situations where a couple more hits from Luis Salvato, and this one could have been over. Now we're back to square one. And we talk about how these decks were nearly identical, but these tiny little changes are, you know, coming into effect. You are seeing, you know, Seth Manfield playing a couple of Exclusion Mages main being very, very relevant in this matchup. But there it is. matter, Tempest Jin. So what's going to happen now? Luis Salvato gets to replay his Siren Storm Tamer, and then he just slams a 4-4 fourth, a four, four flyer, and now Seth Manfield's just staring at a brick wall. Yeah, I mean, he, he's just... This Tempest Gin is going to slam the door shut. It's bigger than all of the ground creatures that Seth has on the battlefield. Seth needs a Tempest Gin of his own, but if he doesn't have an island, it, he still won't be able to trade with the Tempest Gin that's on Luis's side. He's going to play a Siren Storm Tamer. Better have something else, though, Seth. And he passes the turn back. Also no land drop, although here's a Merfolk Trickster. Okay, so Seth going for some tempo plays here. Yeah, the question is, does Luis Salvato want to use a Siren Storm Tamer just to kill this activation from the Merfolk Trickster? I think so. I think you want to close the door here as quickly as possible. Ooh, and Luis has a curious obsession as well. So he can... Oh, Siren Storm Tamer does not actually counter... Oh, no, it does, it does counter the ability. Okay. Yeah, he's considering if he wants to use that here. I mean, it does take away some of his board presence and a bit of his mana for the turn. And remember, this is only a temporary effect on the Tempest Gin, so he could decide just to keep playing through it. Right. But if he feels like the time is now, then he may just use it and keep the massive pressure going. Now he's going to let it happen. So okay. Tempest Gin's going to get tapped. And Seth Manfield's kind of in the go-wide strategy here. It looks like he's got four creatures out now. Yeah, but bunch of bunch of 2-2s two on the battlefield. Luis is, is going to suit up his flyer with the Curious Obsession, get in. And Seth now has the option of either jumping or just taking the damage. I imagine he's going to take it here. And Luis looked like he had landed hand, so he does want to find a creature here to at least try to block all these 2-2s two that are on the battlefield. Again, the issue still stands where if Seth doesn't have another way to interact with that Tempest Gin, Luis can just choose to keep that Tempest Gin back, which will basically brick wall all of Seth Manfield's uh, attack and still just continue to get in with that Siren Storm Tamer with the Curious Obsession. Looks like Seth really contemplating whether or not he wants to go for the chump block here to deny Luis Salvato a card from the Curious Obsession trigger. He does. Miss Cloaked Herald out of the hand there for Luis Salvato and onto the battlefield. So the clock continues, though life total is still high for both players at 16 apiece. 
So this is a new addition to the Mono Blue Tempo deck. Previously, it was Slitherblade that was played, but that is no longer legal as we have now moved into a world where Guilds of Ravnica is legal and Amonkhet has rotated. So mm. now you're a little more vulnerable to the Goblin Chain Whirler that might exist in the world, but still having a one-man evasive creature is very, very important for Curious Obsession. All right, finally, Seth Manfield is able to get a copy of Tempest Gen of his own down, and he does have that critical fourth island to get it to enough power equal to the toughness of the other Tempest Gen, so at least a trade possible on that position. Now, this is a huge sequence here for Salvato, because if he can get that Gin out of the way even temporarily, it represents a heck of a lot of damage, a free card. If he can't, though, he's getting in for one. Yeah, I don't think he has a good attack here anymore. That Tempest Gin that Seth has on the battlefield is a 4-4, meaning that he can use it to trade with Luis Salvato's uh, Tempest Gin. But then Luis then loses all of his blockers for all the 2-2s two that Seth has on the battlefield. So the only decent option that he has here is just attacking with that Miss Cloak Herald. So I think we're kind of looking at a stalemate here. Yeah, and he did need to attack with a creature to keep Curious Obsession around. It doesn't have to be the one that it's uh, attached to. Yeah. So getting in with that Miss Cloak Herald, not just the one damage, but also allows Luis Salvato to keep Curious Obsession on the battlefield, which, you know, he's one card away from that having that be very relevant. Right. Ooh. Things perhaps twisting back towards Seth Manfield, though, as he's eyeballing a big attack here. Yeah, one card Luis Salvato really might want to draw here is Sleep. Seth doesn't have a Siren Storm Tamer on the battlefield to counter it. And Sleep would allow Luis to be able to get in for a huge attack and then lock down Seth Manfield's team for two turns. Oh, wow. And Seth has... Turn this around. He looks like he has another Tempest Gin in hand with Spell Pierce backup. So Seth making a huge attack here, willing to throw away one of his tutus here just to get in for the maximum amount of damage. So Luis Salvato, he's already down to 10 life. He can use Tempest Gin to get to block and remove one of the tutus on the battlefield, but that would mean that he's going to take a huge chunk of damage from that Tempest Gin. This does force Luis to do something on his side of the battlefield as well, as that's a lethal attack. So looking at eight damage here now, Luis could choose to take it and go to two, or look to just chump block the Tempest Gin just to save four points of damage. Alternatively, he can just put the Tempest Gin in front of Seth's Tempest Gin just to go for the trade. But I think Luis's win condition here is to find that sleep and try to outrace Seth Manfield. So he really, that's his win condition. That's, sure. that's the way he's going to win. So he cannot afford to trade that Tempest Gin that's on the battlefield. Yeah, if he does, he could kill Seth in two hits. Right now, he's got nine power on the, battle on the battlefield. Excuse me, eight. But that's plenty if he can find sleep and resolve it, though. At least from our perspective, that doesn't look super likely with... Uh, with sleep with a uh, spell pierce in hand now for Manfield. Yeah, I don't know what Luis Salvato's last card in hand is. If he was holding an island, he could go island sleep, which would kind of spell lethal damage. Let's take a look. Oof, island curious obsession in hand for Salvato. All right. Well, you know that does give him an extra draw. He can put that uh, curious obsession on the miscloaked herald right, right. to get in. He can also. Maybe attack with the Siren Storm Tamer. If he wants to find additional creatures, like uh, Merfolk Trickster would be fantastic, as it would be able to basically deal with two of Seth's creatures for a turn. So he might need to find those additional draws. Oh, no, he cannot. Yeah, no, he can't attack with Siren Storm Tamer, of course. There's a Tempest Gin on the battlefield. But yeah, it looks like Curious Obsession on the Herald to try to find, you know, a, uh, a Merfolk Trickster, maybe a Sleep is kind of Luis's route to victory. And there's also kind of an interesting scenario here where the Curious Obsession on the Tempest Gin would make his Tempest Gin have five toughness versus the two currently, <laughs> I stress currently, four power Tempest Gins on the other side. That would be quite a gambit, but he could try to take that line. And is that what he's doing? Yeah, that's what he did. He put it on the Tempest Gin. Oh, and he's attacking with it wow. too. Wow. Get in there. This is a huge attack. This is getting in for seven. seven. Yeah. And Seth doesn't have a great block, so I think Seth is just going to take it here. Do you have lead tools at? 
Yeah, he would be chump blocking with Tempest Jin. Also of note, Salvato played that island out of his hand, so Seth knows exactly what he doesn't have in his hand. Now he will get one card, right. and perhaps there's a card that Salvato has in mind, like Sleep we mentioned before, uh, although we know that wouldn't actually work out here. But any of the big tempo plays could keep him alive, potentially. Yeah, and Luis really hoping that Seth does not find another island or a creature that's relevant. Uh, it's really interesting because Seth is so close to just killing Salvato in the air anyway, like even if he chump blocks here, but just not quite. He'll be one short, and he right. can't get him on the ground either because both creatures could get chump blocked. But he's just going to deny him wow. that and chump block here. Just the chump block there. Wants to keep his life total very healthy. Well, he almost has him dead here, right? Right. And if you take, let's take a look at Seth Manfield's hand here. He does have chart a course. Oh boy. Oh, and he found Island. So if he can chart a course into a bounce of any type, he can just win on the spot. Right. Okay, here he goes. He's gonna kick things off with chart a course. He's in the market for, well, many things. An exclusion mage would do it. Merfolk trickster. Trickster would do it. He's gonna discard and negate to it. Does he have it? Remember, Salvato's on nothing. Doesn't look like he has it. So he's going to attack with everything. This is going to force not one, but two chump blocks on the ground. I guess Luis... Or actually, one of them's a trade, I should, I should yeah, say. Lu Luis could technically... Yeah, he could do just, this, too. Just take four here and go to Yeah, two. he could. Try to find again. Ugh, this makes me nervous. <laughs> oh, no, and he's going for the block. Okay, that... That makes sense. All right, so <laughs> now Seth, though, after having chump block last turn, is still at a cool 15 life. No way for Salvato to kill him this turn. He's got seven this turn. So if he can attack, he can still, like, attack, find sleep, then play an island. That would be seven and eight damage. <laughs> in we go. Here comes the Tempest Here we go. Gin. Need to find something here. Tr Trickster or sleep would do it. I think he's got an opt in his hand. Ooh, that, that's not Which is good. actually not good enough because of Spell Pierce. Oh, well, but Seth did discard Spell Pierce, so maybe he doesn't oh, he have did. Spell Pierce anymore. Oh, okay. Let's take a look. You're right. Oh, but he's got oh, a Oh, he's got Wizards okay. of Ris Ris Tord, even better. So Seth knows that he's got this thing on lockdown. And with one card in hand, oh, man. Luis Salvato even found it, but Wizards Retort will end the game on the spot, and that's yep. gonna do it. Game number one goes to Seth Manfield. That means he is just a mere four games away. Now, a quick reminder, we're playing best of one here. There's no sideboards, nothing like that, and Seth will now be retiring that deck. Right. He can't play his mono blue deck anymore. On Luis Salvado's side, he can choose any of his decks, including the one that he just played, right. whatever he wants. If, if Luis wants to win, this matchup, no matter what, he still needs to pick up a win with that mono blue deck. Mm -hmm. So he may choose to stick with it, or he may uh, try to guess what what uh, what Seth's going to take. Yeah, so I was actually talking a little bit with Seth, asking him, do you have any strategy wh whatsoever going in? Mm -hmm. And he was just like, you know, I think I want to choose the deck that has the lowest chance of winning and try to get that out of the way quickly. <laughs> okay. So I think maybe he felt that the blue deck was the worst uh, of his options, he and he must be extremely relieved to get that, get that win uh, right away. All right, he is a rip the Band-Aid off quickly guy, and uh, he is off to a good start for Seth Banfield. He's up a game, just needs to win three more to be player of the year. We are going to take a short commercial break here from Atlanta. When we come back, we'll have more Player of the Year playoff. We'll see you on the other side.
everyone. Welcome back to the feature match area here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Marshall Cycliffe with Paul Chion. We are playing our player of the year playoff between Luis Alvado and Seth Manfield. We already have one game done, uh, and we are playing best of one. Each player has brought four decks to the battlefield here, and they are now choosing what they want to play for their second one. The one caveat here is that Seth having one with his mono blue deck, he can't choose that again. All right, we're going to get a chance to see what Luis Salvado's on What's first. He gonna, is he what is it going to be? He's yes, he back. is. He's going to stick with Mono Blue Tempo. He likes the matchup against the other decks from Manfield. And Manfield has three other decks to choose from. Let's see what he's chosen. Mono Red, red Aggro. That's now, you'll see a, a, a trend here among the decks, Paul, for, for proactive, single-focused decks, right? And, you know, the reasoning being that you give up so much uh, by taking a mid-range deck that you don't ever get to sideboard with. Right, right. The, the mid-range deck's true strength is the fact that they are they have positive matchups against most decks after sideboard because you can retool your deck with duresses and cheap sweepers and stuff like that. And it's really hard to you know have all the perfect cards in game once. But after you transform and turn all your bad cards into good cards, you have favorable matchups against almost everything. But that means that you're just naturally not great game one. You know, the classic, the black green mid-range deck is the classic 50% against everything. Mm. Whereas if you look at a deck like maybe mono red aggro, that might be a 55% game one deck and a 45% post-board game, mm -hmm. uh, post-board deck. So I think going into this where you're playing best of one in terms of the different decks that you're playing against, the linear strategies are the superior options. All right, well, let's take a look once again at Luis Salvato's uh, mono blue tempo archetype that he's brought to the table here. Uh, as you said, a few diff a few changes from uh, versions past, but basically it's the same type of thing, leveraging the raw power of cards like Tempest Gin and then trying to get Curious Obsession online and rolling as quickly as possible with cheap interaction in the form of Dive Down and sometimes Wizard's Retort or Siren Storm Tamer to protect your creature. Spell Pierce also, of course, on that list. Um, Seth Manfield, though, he, again, was forced to retire that deck. So it won, it's out, and he had to look at the remaining three options, and he's gone with his mono red. So mono blue to mono red here, Paul. Uh, ooh, for exper Experimental Frenzy, I like that. Yeah, so Experimental Frenzy really takes... You know, when you're playing a deck like that, you want to keep your curve extremely low, like the deck that you see, and you also want a lot of face burn. You want to you want to be able to close out the game with a lot of extra burn, and so the innovation that a lot of players have made is to include wizards in this deck. So you get to add four copies of Wizards Lightning, and guess what? D2 Lava Runner and Viashino Pyromancer are are wizards that allow you to cast Wizards Lightning for one mana. And if you notice, you know. New card here. We got we have a couple of Guilds of Ravnica cards here. We have Experimental Frenzy and Runaway Steamkin. The combination of those two cards also can lead to some very, very explosive turns as Runaway Steamkin can help you generate mana as you keep casting spells off the Frenzy. Yeah, that Frenzy is a fantastic card. And Runaway Steamkin already having an impact in modern, in fact. Uh, we got a chance to see that at Grand Prix Atlanta last weekend. And... Uh, it paired up with its Guilds of Ravnica friend, Arclight Phoenix, to uh, to do quite a bit of damage. So cool to see these cards coming about. And we're going to be uh, getting down to business here once the players are ready. I did want to mention, uh, leading into this tournament, I had a chance to chat with a couple oh, with with our players here. And, man, there's some interesting stuff came out of it. Um, one of them, Luis Salvado's road to get here. After Pro Tour 25th anniversary, he wanted to hunt down Seth Manfield, who was in the lead for Player of the Year. And Salvato, he was committed. Very, very committed. So starting in, in August 11th, he went to Orlando. G these are all GPs where he finished 96, so it didn't improve his, his uh, point total. Then the next weekend, he went to LA. He got 72nd there. Then the next weekend, and I'm talking about consecutive weekends, he went to Prague, <laughs> and he got 169th there, probably jet-lagged. Then the very next weekend, he came back for the double GP in Richmond. He played both GPs, Legacy and Standard. Jeez. He got 170th and then a solid 24th place in the Standard. Then the next weekend, like, I don't think he went home. I mean, I don't know how you go all the way back to Argentina in between these, but now he's in Detroit. He finished 33rd, which left one tournament left, which was, of course, the next weekend. So these are all consecutive weekends in a row. That was GP Stockholm, where he needed to make the top eight just to tie Seth Manfield. If he made it past the quarterfinals, he would have been the player of the year because this was the last tournament wow. that you could do it at. He made the top eight of this tournament. He ended up playing against Andre Strasky in the quarters. He lost to Andre. 
Andre ended up winning the tournament. And and that tied him, and that's why we're here. I, the funny part is, I just picture Seth Manfield at home watching coverage for like six weeks in a row, going, "This guy won't stop." He's just sweating Luis at every tournament. I mean, like, he was gone for what is this seven weeks? It's six, in a seven row. weeks. Yeah, it's just insane. And not only that, it's, it wasn't even like all within the U.S. He was going from L.A. to Prague, back to Richmond, and then to Stockholm. Yeah, yeah, incredible uh, dedication from Luis Salvador. I'll remind you, by the way, as the players are resolving mulligans, they, they do get one free mulligan since we're playing a best out of one. It's a little tough to put that much pressure on just one game, so the players get one free mulligan to seven, and no, you don't get to scry if you mulligan to seven. And then, of course, you can continue as normal yeah. I th after that. I think one of, one of the... Um, I think the reason why Luis chose to play this Mono Blue Tempo deck is I think of the decks that were submitted, Mono Blue Tempo might be the one that you want to go first the most because of that draw that we were talking about. Turn one evasive creature into Curious Obsession with backup mm -hmm. is kind of the ideal start. So you like when you're going first, it's, you really want to play this deck. And when you're on the draw, I mean, this deck doesn't look like it's especially well situated to break serve against other, other aggressive strategies. And I don't know if Seth Manfield determined that Luis was going to play Mono Blue again. But, uh, you know, it looks like he chose to go with Mono Red. Uh, again, this is a format that we're not especially used to. So very curious what their thought process was when they were kind of going to uh, choose their decks. Does this one have the tools? It has Sire and Storm Tamer, Spell Pierce, Tempest Gin. No yeah. Curious Obsession, no One Drop. Yeah, but I think Tempest Gin Oh, is I might have lied. <laughs> yeah, Siren Storm Tamer. But sorry. he doesn't have the Obsession, but I think it is extremely important. I think Tempest Gin, actually, in this matchup, might be one of the most important cards because it has that fourth toughness. And the mono red deck doesn't really have a lot of ways to deal four damage. You know, you have shock, you have lightning strike, and you have wizard's lightning. Uh, but you know, oftentimes a lot of these decks don't play cards like lava coil. But Seth actually does have a couple of copies of lava coil in his deck. And if you notice, there's Seth firing off that shock immediately wow. because Luis Salvato could potentially have had the draw where he goes curious obsession with spell pierce or dive down backup, and Seth did not want that to be possible. Yeah, no chill from Seth Manfield. He gets that thing off the battlefield immediately. Luis Salvato, though, curving out nicely, that Storm Tamer, it's dead, but he followed up with the Merfolk Trickster to start applying some amount of pressure to Manfield while he's tapped out, especially. And here's the turn three Tempest Gen. So this the start. one, two, three is pretty beautiful here if you're sitting in Salvato's seat. And boy, I'll tell you what, if you're sitting in Salvato's seat, you are feeling the pressure. The first person to win a game with all four of the decks that they brought will be your player of the year, having won this playoff. And uh, he's already down a game. But Seth, going to have a very, very tough time dealing with this Tempest Gen. Again, only two Lava Coils in the main deck to cleanly answer it. Otherwise, he's going to need to use two removal spells or two burn spells to get that Tempest Gin off the battlefield. Yeah, it's either that or the, or the Lava Coil that you mentioned before. And while the shields are down, this is the time to do it. I wonder if Seth is considering uh, kind of chump attacking or attacking with the Pyromancer and then using a burn spell to get that Tempest Gin off the battlefield. I mean, boy, I'm sitting there staring over at that. Uh, at that gin and thinking, I would throw two cards at that. Like, that yeah. thing's going to kill me so quickly. And he does go for it, and Luis is like, look, this is my route to victory. Another Viachino Pyromancer is going to ping Salvato down to 14, but look at this. He gets to untap yeah. with Tempest Gin on the battlefield. It's a dream. And if you're wondering here, if you take a look at Seth Manfield's hand, he had Goblin Chain Whirler and multiple Wizards Lightning in hand. So you go, well, why didn't he make the man efficient play here of just running out that Goblin Chain Whirler? Because that would have provided a big clock. I think what Seth Manfield really, really wants to set up here is a turn on, on the next turn where he goes Goblin Chain Whirler into Wizards Lightning, which would be four damage to get that Tempest Gen off the battlefield. I see chats asking some questions like, do they have to play the same type of decks? No. No. And they didn't, in fact. Uh, we'll, we'll be showing you, you. You'll get a chance to see the decks as we go through. Uh, but they're not necessarily on all the same, although there was some overlap for sure. Uh, I think both of the players appropriately recognizing that 
you know, being aggressive in a format where there's no sideboards was the way you want to go. Okay, so this is that's big. chart a course with no downside here. Right, but Luis really Ooh, wanted. To he missed. Luis really wanted to find a land there. He didn't have that fourth land because he didn't play it before attacking with that Tempest Gin. and then he did draw a miscloaked Herald, but doesn't want to leave his Herald vulnerable to a Goblin Chain Whirler or a combination of Chain Whirler plus Wizard's Lightning, which would have decimated Luis's board. Mm. So he's choosing to keep up Spell Pierce here instead in case Seth has the double burn spell required to get that Tempest Gin off the battlefield. So one thing I could see Seth do is lead out with Wizard's Lightning to see if that resolves, but then Seth can follow that up by playing Mountain Chain Whirler, and Salvato will not have a counter wow, available Wow, Spell here. Pierce unavailable for a Chain Ooh. Whirler, and that's a big sequence right back in Seth Manfield's direction. Great stuff from Seth. Yeah, that was really, really rough. Now, what Luis could have done there is um, play the Spell Pierce and force Seth Manfield to tap down two mana. But again, Seth did have the second Wizard's Lightning in hand. So he would have played, paid for the Spell Pierce, play Mountain, and ultimately still been able to kill that Tempest Gin. And look at this, Manfield getting aggressive here using a Wizard's Lightning just to take out the 1-1. One, one. See if he offers a trade for the Trickster, and he will. His, he certainly seems to be in the business of keeping the board clear on the other side to minimize oh, effects. And look, at, look this. at this. Now you see why he wanted to get rid of all the cards in his hand. It's experimental frenzy with no cards left. Just perfect here for Manfield. Yes, yeah, Seth has a board advantage, mana advantage, and then experimental frenzy, which can potentially allow him to just, you know, play a ton of spells. The only, the only way you fizzle is if you have two lands on top. That's right. And it looks like that's what happened. Yeah, it did, because he hasn't played that, at least thus far, whatever the next card is. And Seth Manfield cannot play cards out of his hand because Experimental Frenzy does not allow you to play spells that are in your hand. But you do have the out clause here. If you pay three and a red, you can sacrifice Experimental Frenzy so that you can you can play the cards that you drew. So over time, if you do, if you have somehow sculpted the perfect hand that you want to cast, you can sacrifice the Frenzy to start playing them. Yeah, and that can happen. Sometimes the cards can kind of pile up in your hand, though. You know, the tendency should be for lands to end up there, and, and hopefully your spells are coming yeah. off the top of the library. There's Charta yeah. Course now. For Salvato, he has a pair of Merfolk trister, Tricksters attacking. Oh, my attacking. goodness. Look oh, at and this. Tempest Gin. Hello. Welcome back to the game, Luis Salvato. Yeah, and Luis really needed several things. Wait, wait. Did he draw? Oh, he drew. Okay. Yeah, he did. All right, so what can Seth string together here? Well, a Pyromancer is fine, but he's got five more mana to spend. Can he spend it? He takes a quick peek. He can look at any time. Right. Yeah, other cards that can get stuck on top of the library or other copies of Experimental Frenzy that he may not want to have on the battlefield. Right. And, of course, the lands that you mentioned as well. Here comes the Chain Whirler just unabashedly attacking. I think Seth's just saying, you're not going to block. Yeah, that's your win condition, man. But wow, look at this. Is he bluffing? <laughs> Luis Salvato's <laughs> looking like, I might block, dude. No, he's not going to. Okay. Because remember, it has to be that one card on top of the library. Right. The He's, cards in hand are... It's a, it's a one-card hand. Yeah. Seth now, has one-card hand effectively now, with the Frenzy. Technically, it could be like a shock or whatever. He could sacrifice the Frenzy and play it, yeah. right? But that's a big cost, <laughs> too. <laughs> but at the same time, Seth can't just play it slow here, right? That Tempest Total. Gin is uh, going to be lethal in a couple of turns. It's a six-power flyer here. It's a two-turn clock. Seth hands not updating. Can Seth manage to find the burn spells required to win this game? <laughs> Seth kind of slow rolled himself, but he knew what that card was. So it looks like he hit some, some 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 land pockets there with experimental frenzy, which is the downside of the card. You can't just go go infinite. It looks like he's got another one. Oh no! There it is. That's and also bad. This is very committal as well because now he has to get rid of both. <laughs> Yeah, and now Luis Salvato has lethal next turn, and I believe he has a spell pierce in his hand, too. Yeah, and I think this is just... He's down to three, and he has three blockers here for two creatures that are on the battlefield. I think Seth might just be dead here. 
even if there's a Lava Coil on top of his deck, Luis does have that Spell Pierce. That, that was a huge chart, of course. It allowed him to find that Tempest Chain which, to, to help steal that game. Oh, and protection. And we've tied it up. All right, that is going to do it. One game apiece for our players. And Salvato says, it's good to be on <laughs> the board, up. baby. One game apiece. He kisses that deck goodbye. He's like, I'm done with this. Because he's got to send that one away. And uh, now both players have won a game with their mono blue deck. And as we mentioned before, we're playing kind of a different strategy or excuse me, a different uh, type of tournament here for our player of the year playoff. Just to give you a quick recap, both players brought four standard decks to the battlefield here that can't overlap by more than eight cars. So they're quite different than each other. Yes. And they get to choose one to play against each other. If they win with that deck, it's out. They can't play with it anymore. Uh, if you lose, you can choose to play the deck that you just played, or you can change to a different one. And the first player to win a game, best of one, with each of these decks, wins. Yeah, a lot more magic to be played here. Both players need to win at least three more matches to, you know, hoist the title of player of the year. All right, well, it sounds like uh, floor reporter Tim Willoughby is down with the word with Luis Salvato. Luis. It took a couple of goes, but you managed to get the first points on the board with the mono blue list. Of course, the very first match that you had, it was, you had no real way of knowing what was going to be going on. Were there some mind games for that second game, trying to figure out which yeah. deck to play? Well, he read me insane because I thought that he would think that I will choose other deck. Uh, and I choose the mono blue because of that. And he chose the one, one, the only of the three decks that it was really bad for me, and I expect to avoid that. But well, I got lucky and got this game. Still plenty of mind games to play though, because now we're at the point where it's time to pick your deck for the third of the one game matches that we have going on. I'm going to let you have a little th think about that one as we get ready for this our third match here in this Player of the Year playoff. Best of luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tim. You can see quite a bit of joy on the face well, he, of I mean, Salvato because he, he kind of stole behind. that one, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that advantage bar was flopping around. I mean, th wow. that's how quickly that, I mean, Tempest Jin can just close out games so quickly. You know, Seth was able to deal with the first one, but I mean, you know, just a couple of chump blocks. I mean, Seth, I mean, sorry, Luis needed so many things to go right to actually be able to pull that game. He needed to find that Tempest Jin as quickly as possible and for Seth to basically fizzle on that experimental frenzy. Look at Seth. He's looking at his decks and trying to decide which <laughs> of the three remaining ones to choose. Oh, he's not rolling a die to determine? Apparently not. Maybe he's rolling a die in his head. Yeah. This is great. Look, look, Luis is doing the same thing. Like, all right, what do I do? <laughs> this is interesting. I mean, this is a... a, a a decision point that we don't get in normal magic, right? Normally, this decision would have been made two days ago, and you would show up and and you you know you run what you brung, as they say. And here, it's like he's you know both players are trying to think. Well, what direction will they go? Maybe Seth is mad at the mono red deck and wants to set it aside for a while. Maybe he thinks you know what what do I think that uh, that yeah. Luis might bring to the table? Well, yeah, and one important thing also to to note is the fact that Seth is going first now because he lost the last match. So he might look to play a deck that he thinks has, uh, you know, is a much better deck going first. Now, of course, most decks are going to be better going first, but, you know, certain decks might be better than, better, better than others. You ever get mad at your, at your deck? Mad at my deck? Yeah, like when it doesn't work, it doesn't give you enough lands, it, it loses too much. Do you ever get mad at it? Uh, I try not to. I've played so much Magic at this point where, you know... Just don't I mean, have it in you yeah, anymore? I mean, so, this, so, <laughs> I just don't feel anything anymore. No, no. But, you know, of course there will be frustrations. All right, here let's, we go. Let's see who's playing what here for our third game of the Player of the Year playoff. Boros Weenie in the hands of Seth Manfield. And look at this. Oh. The control deck. Now, Luis Salvato. I love this counter, by the way. He told me, look, 
we've been talking about how you want to pick uh, you know, these aggressive decks, and a lot of the decks that the players submitted are. But Salvato said, look, my big picture game plan is I don't want to be in the middle. I either want to be really fast or really slow. And this is his really slow deck. And I got to say, this looks pretty good for Luis Salvato because he's playing against Seth, not even the fastest deck that Seth brought to the battlefield. Let's take a look at Seth's list here. This is Boros. He's added white to his R deck now. Red. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, yeah. He added white to the right, right, deck right, that we already right, saw. Right, yeah. right, right, right. And there, so now he's got Boros. Yeah, which basically, um, if you if you look at his list, it is basically a white weenie deck with a light touch of red, splashing red for heroic reinforcements. Now, hero heroic reinforcements is an extremely powerful card. Synergizes really, really well with uh, history of Benalia. Um, but the only question that I have when I look at this is. Does the deck actually have enough red sources to support playing Four, the reinforcements? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? Nine is kind of light. In a 60-card deck? In, in that is not a card, lot. In a 60-card deck, I think a good percentage of the time, maybe 25, I haven't really run the numbers, a good percentage of the time, this card might be stranded in your hand. But uh, Seth Manfield uh, deciding that it is, in fact, worth it to play heroic reinforcements here. And if you look at the rest of the deck, streamlined, aggressive deck, very, very nice curve with Banalish Marshall, History of Banalia, very, very powerful three-mana creatures, and then uh, topping out the curve with those reinforcements. Boy, I, I got to tell you, I don't think he wants to see that mountain in his hand very often. He's got oh, a yeah. lot of one-drops. He's got the Banalish Marshall to curve into, and right. even History of Banalia. But, um, but this deck, though, still very fast, right? I mean, this is a type of deck that can get you dead super quick. And uh, on the other side of the table is the control deck. It's Jeskai Control from Luis Salvato. Does he have the tools? Oh my god, for Deafening Clarion. Absolutely. He has the tools. Absolutely. Now, if you're talking about a deck, one of the better decks at trying to break serve, it is the Jeskai Control deck because you get to play four copies of Deafening Clarion. This is the exact type of card that you need to come back when your opponent has an overwhelming board presence. It's th that's exactly what these aggressive, both the aggressive red and white strategies are trying to do. So, you know, with the free mulligan, if I'm Luis Salvato, I am actively looking for Deafening Clarion because that is the most important card in this matchup. Boy, what a nice pick here for Salvato, just counter-punching against, uh, <laughs> against Seth and, and probably hoping that he picked the exact list that he did because he gets the Deafening Clarion. It's also, you know, this deck can take a long time to actually win the game. He's got the Niv Mizzets there, a couple of Crackling Drakes, and then I'm assuming that that's an expansion explosion at the end there. But, you know, this is one of those decks that even if he takes control, can take a little while to actually get the job done. And against a mono red deck, you know, sometimes they're like shock you, and you're like, right. oh, no, here we yeah. go. And, right, you get chipped away at, but that's not going to happen here. If he can keep the board under control, he'll win. Yeah, one nice card that you'll see in this deck, which, you know, honestly, I didn't know it was actually going to make it in standard is revitalized. Oh, that's One nice. One and white. <laughs> pay three life to draw, uh, sorry, gain three life and draw a card, which is very, very good if you are playing against a burn deck, but also buys you some time, right? It, allow, it, it cycles, lets you hit your land drops, and it might even force your aggressive opponents to overextend. Now, if I'm on Seth Manfield's start, uh, side, one of the more important creatures that I want to draw is Adanto Vanguard. Adanto Vanguard is very, very difficult to remove. Uh, but, you know, Luis Salvato does have those seal aways as well to deal with it. Now, I'll remind the, the, the viewers that the players, as they prepare to, uh, to resolve mulligans here, you know, they do get a free mulligan. Chat was pointing out, maybe the, you can get away with a little bit by only having the nine red sources because of that mulligan. Does that factor in for you? Do you not, think you can not, cheat a little on mana? You, you know, I think it's a consideration, but not too much. Because, like, the thing is, if you if your opening hand is fine, you're still most of the time not going to mulligan, and it might still have that heroic reinforcements. So I don't I don't think that that plays too much. If you're playing a deck with maybe 26 lands, you might consider going to 25. But for decks that are kind of lighter on lands, I don't. I don't think that's how I build my decks. And I think, you know, I was talking to Seth a little bit about why he chose to play this, and he's like, well, it actually just uh, won a, a pretty big tournament on Magic Online. So he was just like, you know what? This guy's done a lot of testing. It's probably not too bad. There's an option of three mulligan. The second mulligan go to six again. I think it will be good. But yeah, Luis Salvato definitely, definitely looking for some combination of that early interaction. You see Niv Mizzet and Teferi are some of the worst cards you want to see in your opening hand. You just want to see a handful of Revitalizes, Deafening Clarions, and, um, and uh, Seal Aways. One really, really uh, powerful interaction that we're probably going to see uh, 
quite a few times over the course of this weekend is the interaction between Crackling Drake and Deafening Clarion. Oh it gosh. is completely Ooh. brutal. That is how you close the window or close the close out games against aggressive strategies. Deafening Clarion does have a second mode. It's not just three mana, three, three damage to all creatures. It also gives all your creatures lifelink. You know, having a Crackling Drake on the battlefield with five or six spells in a graveyard, that's a huge swing and extremely difficult for a lot of these decks to kind of come back from once you kind of assemble that one-two punch. It even adds another spell to the graveyard for you, right? It does, it's just it does. super synergy, man. It does it all. That is nasty. I I'm sure people would have been uh, yelling at play design if Crackling Drake was a three-toughness creature. They're like, come on, I'm trying to do the thing. You're not letting me do it. <laughs> Let's see if we can get Mulligans resolved here between our two players, and we'll get underway in game number three. The players have so far split a game apiece. This is the player of the year playoff. The winner of this will be your player of the year. This is a, a chance for history for both of our players as they, uh, at least Seth goes back to the drawing board. Uh, one question. Uh, talking about it from Luis Salvato's perspective, we were talking about the mana base for Manfield. But I mean, all told, you know, all of his lands come into play untapped if they, it, you know, in realistic scenarios, and uh, and and he's not going to have a problem with that. Is what's the mana look like for a full-on three-color deck that's running, you know, Niv Mizzet alongside some white cards and such? Uh, well, it isn't, it isn't as good um, because right now we're we're living in a world where you have only access to some of the shock lands. You don't have all of the shock lands. Mm -hmm. So sometimes your your sources aren't going to be perfectly ideal. Uh, and you know if you do happen to get a hand with too many of the shock lands, that will be extremely painful, especially against a streamlined aggressive deck like Seth's. And I think that's part of why Revitalize is a card that's played in this deck because you know you do want to smooth out your draws. You might take some damage when you play those shock lands, and you need some way to recoup that life loss. And uh, revitalize is that card. Okay, we're going down to six cards here for Seth Manfield. That means he mulliganed from seven to seven, and now down to six. But he's got a keeper. And it looks like we're just about ready to get underway here in game number three. Uh, and, and look at Salvato's hand. I mean, this is just the perfect, you know, one of the ideal starts is having Shockland and then all the buddy lands. Because in the Jeskai deck, your shock lands will basically unlock all the buddy lands that you have. Buddy lands being, you know, cards like Glacial Fortress and Sulphur Falls, which requires you to have a certain basic land type to, in order for them to come into play untapped. But he's got just, again, the ideal start. He's got that Deafening Clarion to go with that seal away. So a lot of answers here. I don't yeah. know if we That being said, uh, one two punch here for Manfield thus far. He's got the Sky Marcher Aspirant to kick things off. And look at this right into th into turn three, Banalish Marshall to pump up the team. And even though that Knight of Grace isn't going to be particularly silver bullety here, uh, it is plenty fine to start cracking in yeah, but, for six damage. But here. Luis is just going to take it. He's going to go to 12. This uh, White Weenie deck doesn't really have a whole lot of reach. Now Luis can just play it slow, play that opt, untap, play Deafening Clarion, get a very clean three for one, and still hold that seal away that he has in his hand. Does he have Deafening Clarion as well? I, b I believe he did when I'll I... tell you I, what, he, he better, because <laughs> otherwise he's pretty <laughs> dead. Otherwise he was he, he proud of Mulligan. And there it is. Bye-bye. There goes the nice entire team from Seth Manfield. His first, second, and third plays of the game all gone, and Luis Salvato is still at 12 life. There's a Dauntless Bodyguard, but that's it for Manfield. Really depressing there for him to just be able to cast a simple 2-1 onto an otherwise empty board, and Salvato has got to be licking at the chops here yeah, as he plays his fourth land and passes. Yeah, and this is a deck that Luis is extremely com uh, comfortable playing. You know, we kind of know him for winning a Pro Tour with Lantern Control, but outside of that, he has played his fair share of control decks. You know, he played blue-white control at the Modern Pro Tour, and he's also played a lot of blue-based control decks in Standard as well. Are we done here, Paul? Look uh, at this turn from Salvato. He took out the only threat with Seal Away. Heroic reinforcements would be big. Oh, close. Oh, but there's Negate on the Conclave oh. Tribunal to save Teferi, and uh, 
yeah, the nails may be in the coffin here for Seth Manfield in game three. That deafening clarion was completely devastating right. and changed the complexion of this game entirely. If he didn't have that, Seth probably would have won in two turns. Now right. it looks like it's just over. And now it's just over, yeah. He's holding uh, Sinister Sabotage here as well. And I wonder what... He's got an opt here, but Banalish yeah. Marshall on its own is just a 3-3 three, three for three. The Crackling Drake... Nicely holding that back. It's currently a 4-4 flyer. Cancel that. And make it a 5-4 flyer. Just, and look, wow. at how, look at how quick he's, so quick. he's playing. Yeah. He, he just knows how to play this deck inside and out. And is this six mana? Is this Niv-Mizzet? Boom! Oh, yeah. There we go. Niv-Mizzet Faroon's on the battlefield now. And now, oh, you can read the text on your screen there. But let's just say a lot of one toughness creatures on the other side isn't going to get the oh, job yeah. done here for Manfield. And, of course, uh, barring those the uh, the damage can just go upstairs. So this one is in the books. This is going to be Luis Salvato winning game number three and pulling ahead in our player of the year playoff two games to one. Seth Manfield fighting the fight here, but he really doesn't have a chance against the board state that's been assembled with this type of deck. It just doesn't have the ability to do anything. I think he, he's seen if he can kill him. Right, because if he can't kill him, uh, if he can't kill him, he'll deal one damage to the Knight of Grace, draw with Teferi, and deal one more damage. Which is exactly what he's done. But but he's got it locked up. He's got a counter spell in hand, too. Yeah, this is a two-turn clock rather than a one-turn clock, but that's the only difference between victory here for Luis Salvato because he has this one in the books. One more draw step for Seth Manfield, and he's going to scoop him up. Two games to one now for Luis Salvato. Boy, he picked correctly for this round, Paul. That did not look close. Deafening Clarion was critical. Yeah, yeah. And... In a for in a matchup where you're on the draw and you know uh, you're expecting kind of an aggressive linear strategy, I think this was kind of the perfect deck to go with on the draw. Well, it's gone now, so it's he gone. has to retire that one, and we're going to get back to the to the slugfest. <laughs> Before we do, though, we're going to take a short commercial break. When we come back, we'll have more Player of the Year playoff here from Atlanta. Don't you go anywhere. Welcome back to the feature match area here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Marcel Sutcliffe with Paul Chion. We are bringing you special coverage of the Player of the Year playoff. These two gentlemen tied each other at the end of a long year of uh, pro point gathering. And uh, they're playing it out right now to see who's going to become our Player of the Year. The players have selected their next deck list, and we get to get to reveal now exactly what we've got. Let's start off with Seth. What does he decide to bring to the table? Is it Drake's? Ooh, this is his uh, his slowest deck, actually. And he's going to be up against Mono Red Aggro. What do you think of the matchup there, Paul? Well, I think... 
This is going to be rough. I think one of the more important cards to, for Seth to have here in this matchup is the cheap burn spells. So, you know, I think he might actually need to mulligan to them. Uh, and given that you have the free mulligan, you want to do that. Okay. Um, you know, cards like Shock and Lava Coil. Um, I think this Seth's current setup doesn't have a lot of sweepers, so I think it does make sense that Seth wants to go first. Okay, why don't we just go ahead and put the, uh, the deck list here for Seth up first to get an idea of what he's looking at with this Is It Drake's deck. Of course, this is a deck that focuses in many ways <clears throat> on Crackling Drake and Enig Enigma Drake, and you can see them here. Yeah, and so a lot of cycling. You see the arc light phoenixes. Yeah, so this was actually the deck that uh, Eduardo Sajglik top eight at a Grand Prix with. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, a, a couple of small changes. Seth Manfield actually did say that this was the deck that he ultimately chose to shave one land from oh. because of kind of the free mulligan rule. If you look, it's only 19 lands that he's playing in this deck. But the way that this deck works is you have a bunch of cheap spells, cantrips. You have both Charter Course. Tormenting Voice and Discovery Dispersal to try to fill your graveyard with spells and Arclight Phoenixes. And then try to amass a bunch of cheap spells to get those Arclight Phoenixes back onto the battlefield. Of course, this is a Spells Matter deck, so you're also playing Enigma Drake and Crackling Drake that also keys off of having a bunch of spells in your graveyard. Now, this is the type of deck that also might struggle breaking serve, especially if you expect an aggressive deck. So I think it might be very important that Seth tries to get the, a win with this deck on the play. It's not like the Jeskai control deck. You do not have access to that Deafening Clarion. So you really need to get the ball rolling and kind of, you know, pedal to the metal, win when you're going first. Yes, in, in shock we trust, I think, is what we're going to see here. Let's take a look at the other side of the table. Mono Red Aggro from Luis Salvato. Yeah, and so this is basically almost this is what identical. We saw before, yeah. This is almost identical to what Seth Manfield uh, was playing. Uh, Luis, instead of playing the two lava coils that Seth Manfield had in his mono red list, has chosen to go with a rekindling Phoenix instead, just to have additional threats. But again, curve out, play a bunch of burn spells, and kind of you know if your opponent has somehow stabilized, win off the back of experimental frenzy. All right, so players are going to be gearing up here to battle and resolve mulligans. I did uh, have a chance to chat with the players as well, and there's actually a lot more at stake here than just player of the year. I know it's hard to imagine uh, a higher stakes than that uh, when you're a Magic player, but one of the things that uh, Luis Salvato said uh, was that he feels like there's three major accomplishments as a professional Magic player, and for him, it's Pro Tour win, yep. World Champion, and Player of the Year. And I thought about it, and I thought, that makes sense. Like, th those are kind of the three highest tier things you can do as a Magic player. And, you know, he said it would mean so much to him to win this Player of the Year because that's two out of three. He would be a Pro Tour champion and a Player of the Year. Just, just got to get that pesky world champion off the list. But it also got me thinking, and I thought, wait a minute. Seth already has two of those, right? Seth has, is a Pro Tour champion and a world champion. If he can win back-to-backs here uh, games against Salvato, he would end up being one of the very, very few people in our game's history to get that trifecta. And I, you know, I thought to myself, has anybody done that? And I had a chat, uh, you know, with, with my people from coverage, and we looked it up. And there are, in fact, two people who have done it before. Kai Buda and John Finkel. Oh, that's, so that's not surprising. If, if Seth <laughs> manages to win this Player of the Year title here, that's the company he would be in. That, that is, it's, yeah. And, the best of the best. You know, what? And, and when I was talking to Salvato about this, you know, he also reminded me, he's like, and this is in the modern era for Seth. All of this is in the modern era, right, right? where we've been, you know, magic's different now than it used to be. Yeah. The, the, I mean, Kai Buda won seven pro tours. Like, that did. ain't happening anymore. But not, yeah, it is not going to happen anymore. The gap has definitely closed. Yeah. The average level, skill level at a pro tour is much higher than it was back in the day. Even when I started playing, which was kind of towards the tail end of Kai's career, even when I played, I would still play against, you know, competition that I would not have expected at the Pro Tour. I was like, oh, this was a little bit surprising. But now, even just anybody that you play against, you will know that it's going to be pretty difficult to get that win. Yeah. You're not just going to get one of those 80-20 matchups that you used to in the past. And that's the interesting part is that, you know, this means that this is an opportunity that Seth Manfield may not get again, right? You don't get that many shots at player of the year, even if you're, you know, at the level of a Seth Manfield. We are underway now in game number four. Luis Salvato got off to a rocky start, but has won back-to-back -back games. And remember, in order for him to be player of the year, he's going to have to win 
a game with all four of the decks that he's brought to the table. All right. Seth Manfield's going to kick things off with Chart a Course. Does he have an Arclight Phoenix? That's one of the ideal cards Ooh. to discard, and he, he does. does. Indeed. Look at this. Guilds of Ravnica all over the place here as uh, Runaway Steamkin hits the battlefield now for Salvato. Yeah, one of the kind of the true all-stars in this mono red deck leads to some just extremely explosive turns. You know, if you can, you know, uh, amass some cheap spells to get the runaway steamkin to three counters, add three more mana, then just play more spells, you can really just kind of run away with the game. Good, oh, good. That was phrasing. not yes. <laughs> <coughs> right. <laughs> well, you kind of <laughs> talked yourself into that know, corner. I'm like, where is he going? I, <laughs> yep. Uh, just embrace it. Man. I mean, you know, just it was intentional. It. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, so this was opt crash through, and yes, Look shock indeed, and that means he's getting this Arclight Phoenix back from the grave and, in fact, attacking this turn down to 17. So this is what the deck's all about, right? Yeah. I, I have found that there is definitely some, some variance involved with how powerful this deck feels, whether or not you can play the turn two tormenting voice through Charter Course and get that Arc Life Phoenix into the graveyard. The games that you do, your win percentage rises significantly. Another Steamkin hits the battlefield here for Salvato. He's staring at his hand though. Perhaps he has a one drop that he'd like to play. No, he's just gonna pass the turn back, facing down once again this Arc Light Phoenix. Very annoying here. Yeah this Hard is to a, get rid of this is one of those cards that I think took people a little bit of time to understand kind of its full power. Because when you first look at it, you're like, who the heck's gonna play three spells in one turn? But we are living in a unique standard environment where we have lots of cheap cantrips. Not only do you have the ability to, uh, to play four ops in your deck, you have Crash Through and Warlord's Flame as additional ways. Warlord's to, Fury, yeah. Warlord's Fury mm -hmm. to play additional cantrips. So there's 12 one mana cantrips in the format, which does position the Arc Life Phoenix to actually, you know, be abusable in standard. Yeah, and then you've also got these these red ways to get cards into your graveyard as well, which aren't always around. Right. Really interesting. And and by the way, in modern, it's a joke. Like well, yeah. you have <laughs> you have a lot of very, very good ways to not only uh, satisfy that casting spells, but also getting stuff in the yard. And we saw that at the GP as well. Yeah, I just assume any time you can put something on the battlefield without paying mana, people are going to find a way to put it into a modern deck. <laughs> that is That's safe assumption what happened. and exactly what happened. <laughs> All right, here's Vinicio Pyromancer, which is going to get another counter on the Steamkin. Steamkin only cares about red spells. And look at this. We're, it looks like we're going to get that third counter on the Steamkin here. Okay, G2 Lava Runner is going to put it on, but he wants to get in for the damage. So hit you for four. Nice. Then, then he can unload here if he wants, if he has more permanents to play. It starts reloading right away. Yep. Thinking about it. Yeah, if he has a creature, I would look to fire it off here. Yeah, he, he does. He has a Goblin Chain Whirler. Yep. And he's just going to cash it in, get the counter back immediately. Wow, this is a huge board. Wow, look at this board state out of nowhere. Yeah, and... He cast three creatures that turn? Right, and Seth Manfield, <laughs> unlike the Jeskai control deck, doesn't have a sweeper in the no. main deck to deal with all of these creatures, which is why Luis can just unload all of his creatures and not really be scared. What in the world is going on with Manfield? He just played land number five and passed. Well, let's take a look. What? Oh no! That can't be his hand. He has Is that five real? lands in hand. Oh my goodness! Uh, Salvato's gonna win this one easily if that's the case. He even cut in a fact, land. That's it right now. Luis Salvato picks up game number three, and he is one game away from defeating Seth Manfield. Two tough losses in a row there for Seth. Yeah. He walks back over to his deck selection choice, and I'll tell you what, he's got a lot of choices left, and Luis does not. He's got one left. Yeah, I mean, he had an ideal start, right? Turn three, he killed a creature, and put a Phoenix in play, and had a bunch of cantrips. The only way 
it looks really bad for him is if all he drew off the cantrips were lands. And that's exactly what he happened. What happened. And keep <laughs> in mind, he shaved the land from his deck. He has 19 lands in his deck and drew 10 of them. He's probably thinking that right now. Yeah. He's probably thinking, I shaved the land from this deck. I don't Seth know. might be mad at his deck, if yeah, you want. Uh, that is incredible. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> even, even a champ like Seth is going to get frustrated at that one. Wow, five lands in his hand. That is a tough one to take. And he has got a lot of work ahead of him if he's going to take down this player of the year playoff from Luis Salvato. Not going to be easy for him. Yeah, and, and now, yeah, Seth has to win with all three decks, and he will at least know what he's playing against. That's right. He can do process of elimination to figure out what's but, left. But it doesn't really matter as he just needs to play, uh, beat Luis with all of them. So I think, you know, he might do a similar... He might. He might just do a similar thing here where he just looks to play the is it deck again mm -hmm. if he's expecting an aggressive deck uh, because it's on the play and then choose to try to break serve with the other two decks that he has. Oof. Tough run for Manfield. He's left scrambling. Like you said, kind of tells you a little bit about his personality based on what he picks here. But it looks like we've got uh, Tim Willoughby down on the floor with a, a quick word with Seth Manfield right now. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's been kind of... A bit of a tough start for you thus far, Seth. Obviously, at this point, at least you've got a clear target in terms of what you're going to be playing against for these remaining games in the playoff. Uh, a few mind games, maybe, in terms of how people have picked out decks thus far. Uh, how much do you think is, is added to you to have this, this extra set of decisions? I mean, yeah, now Luis has one deck to my three, so I have to win um, the next three. So th it's not a great position to be in. Uh, doesn't feel great, but I feel like my deck choices in terms of how they matched up were okay, but sometimes the draws just play themselves out. I don't think I really messed up too much in the games, so it's I'm quite disappointed right now. Um, I'm being honest. Being down 3-1, to one, I'm at a pretty big disadvantage, but uh, trying to still focus on the match because it's, it's not over yet. It's certainly not. I'll let you have your, your final moments to compose yourself, pick out your deck for this next round as we head into our next match here within the Player of the Year finals. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, you can, you can tell from the, the tone of his voice and, and, and everything that, you know, Seth is feeling it, right? He's just like, wow, this is not where I wanted to be. And uh, he's got a mighty hill to climb here if he is going to end up being Player of the Year because Luis Salvato... Boy, he's kind of putting on a show here. These draws have been insane. Right. And, and and on the flip side, Seth, you know, even just the fashion in which he's lost these last two games, you know, the the especially the, the match where he played the mono red deck, where he was ahead on board and tapped out with an experimental frenzy. And from that situation, you're like, it's good. Things have to go extremely wrong for me to lose this game. And basically everything that could have <laughs> happened happened. I mean, his win percent just went straight downhill yeah. from that point, which is really strange because right. the expectation and, is... And then on the, the flip opposite. side, you're playing a 19 land deck and playing all the, play, having the ideal start, getting getting creatures out of the way, playing that Phoenix on turn three, and then just em e e emptying it out with all lands. And here we go. We got Boros Weenie. Looks like for Seth Manfield, he's going to be bringing that. And that means that the last deck remaining for Luis Salvato is white Weenie. So we are going to be seeing a small creature aggro deck matchup here while the players are going to be looking to get on the board quickly, looking to get ahead, and looking to stay ahead. Let's take a look at uh, Seth Manfield's list once again. This is the one that we looked at uh, before. Sorry, what's, what is Silver Break Griffin? <laughs> it is kind of funny. I don't know if, it, if the camera caught it. Let's take a look uh, at the next list because uh, there, there's a, a card for Luis Salvato that uh, you don't actually see that often. Uh, in standard, it, it is legal in standard, though it's not draftable, so you don't see it. And where is it on the on the screen here? There it is, Silver Beak Griffin on the left hand side. There, it's a really simple card. It's a two two flyer for white white. Yeah. Uh, but Seth was like, wait, what is that card? <laughs> yeah, we have a nice term for that. It's called Air Bear. Two mana, <laughs> two two flyer. Air Bear. Air Bear is legal. I it, love Air Bear. It, it was an M nineteen uh, in one of the. The side products uh, and a uh, little surprising to see it here but you know a nice evasive creature most people have chosen to go with Adanto Vanguard which is kind of the, the classic two mana creature to go with but mm -hmm. Luis Salvato deciding to go for the evasion here you know I asked that, him why with that Griffin I asked him why he chose this oh yeah 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 and he said he feels like 
he's likely to get into a lot of race situations. And he feels like Adonto Vanguard is a very poor blocker, right? Under all right. circumstances, it just doesn't do what you want to do as far as blocking goes. And the, the Silver Beat Griffin is actually better at that. So he decided to play it there. Okay, fair enough. He also predicted that Seth might bring a Drake's style deck to the to the tournament, which, by the way, he was correct. Yep. And if that were the case, he values the ability to block even one time, you know, a nine power Drake or yep. whatever up in the air. That should, you know what? You know what's actually more surprising? The Griffin, it's, it's a solid flyer. I can see playing that in an aggressive white deck. Trusty Rusty here, Rustwing <laughs> Falcon, <laughs> yeah. one and a one two flyer. I did not expect that one. To see yeah. him play, you know, a lot of I have seen decks with Healer's Hawk. Seth Manfield is playing Healer's Hawk in his deck, and guess what? In the head-to-head, -head, Rustwing Falcon is the one that wins. Just that not even <laughs> close. Yeah, and you know, I, I was saying, well, wait a minute, why why aren't we seeing Healer's Hawk? No, and uh, you know, you were saying, well, Chain Whirler, right? Like that's kind of the obvious, but now you get the Rustwing Falcon blocking Healer's Hawk, and it's just like trusty Rusty. Yeah. Why did I ever uh, right? go away from you, my friend. Yeah, I mean, also, if you look, yeah, Lu Luis is trying to also minimize the damage that he takes from a card like Goblin Chain Whirler. You know, you see the Rustwing Falcon, but you also see Snubhorn Sentry, which okay, is another I love this, new card. <laughs> yeah, uh, that is great. O an O3 in your white weenie right, aggro right. deck. You know, we've messed, we've dabbled in this card. You know, we just we just call this a couple, there's a couple of nicknames for this. You can either call it Wild Nakato, or uh, or big snubs. Mild Nakato? Kind of, mild Nakato? Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's a milder Nakato. Yeah, it's I mean, not, it's an 03. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the wildest Nakato, that's no, for sure. that is definitely not. But, you know, Snubborn Sentry is nice. It is a good blocker, especially in these aggressive mirrors, right? You, if you even look at this White Weenie deck, there's a lot of one-mana, two-one creatures. So it blocks very well, and it synergizes really well with both History of Banalia and Legion's Landing because uh -huh. those cards put multiple permanents onto the battlefield. So it's pretty easy to actually ascend in this deck. And then you've got a 3-3 three, three for one mana, which is serious right. business. Yeah. So in the in the quest for playable one drops, well, sometimes you find a snub horde sentry. There's a lot of options, actually, yeah. for, for white one drops. There are. Yeah. In fact, there's quite a few that we don't see here that we did see a little earlier on the other side of the battlefield there. Uh, but boy, this is going to be potentially pretty quick. And these players are getting ready to play what could be the last game. Uh, it's really all on Seth Manfield at this point. Uh, you know, like I said, Luis Salvato's kind of put on a show with these draws. I mean, Seth is just, his, his uh, draws have fallen very flat. And uh, Salvato has had some nice ones. And he's just put himself in a beautiful position to pick up a player of the year here. And interestingly, kind of put, bring himself even with Seth Manfield as far as getting those two out of three. Now, right. they're, they're a little offset because he'd still have to win a world championship, which may be the hardest one of them to do. Um, also, of course, you know, Luis Salvato has his friends and teammates here uh, cheering him on. Uh, Seth Manfield too, but in addition to that, his daughter's here. She's cheering him on, and unfortunately, his girlfriend wanted to make it down as well, but uh, she was sick and she couldn't make it, and uh, she's still recovering back at home. But Seth did ask me to say, "Get well soon, Jenny," oh. uh, to his girlfriend. Yeah. So hopefully, uh, she can she can uh, you know at least cheer Seth on from home because that's got to be a tough position, oh, you know. And let's not forget, Seth Manfield is being inducted into the Hall of Fame mm -hmm. as well, and so you know another reason to come down. But yeah. at least his daughter could be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you know, I, I think Seth chose to play this deck. You know, I think it was kind of between this and the Drake deck. But one of the more important cards that really, that's super swingy if you're on the play, is Heroic Reinforcements. Oof. That card is very bad when you're behind. Yes. <laughs> but when you're on the play and you're the one, you're the aggressor, this card really just can, can close out games very, very quickly. Well, they don't call him Trusty Rusty for nothing. Two oh, of them in the good. opening <laughs> the I, opener here. I, He's one air bear away from victory. <laughs> Rustwing Falcon, wow. It does still seem a little weird to see it in the hands of, uh, you know, even if it is modified standard, Look uh, at standard this. player. <laughs> nice Legion's landing, bro. I got this Rustwing Falcon <laughs> just brick walling you. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. Man, field's got to be like, really, dude? <laughs> I can only get to attack a single time with my vampire, like not even once. Yeah. All right, speaking of vampires, there's a Danto Van card now for Seth Manfield. So still a good curve, though. Let's not forget, it's a one-two punch, and Manfield is the one who has a very tall mountain to climb here. Luis Salvato, perhaps on the verge of becoming player of the year, 
There's Dauntless Bodyguard to protect the Rust Wing Falcon. In it comes. And Luis Salvato gets first blood here in this aggressive matchup between the two players. This is effectively mono white versus mono white. It's just Seth has that extra end game punch with uh, the reinforcements. Yeah, so really, really important if Seth has the th one of the three drops. I think basically the most powerful cards in the, uh, in, in the white weenie deck are, come from the three drops. You have Banalish Marshall and History Banalia, and they're so, so strong, uh, you know, and if Seth doesn't have it, that would put him really, really far behind. So he does have the Marshall here. There it is, Banalish Marshall hits the battlefield, and that is gonna unlock some attacks potentially here. Rustwing Falcon, okay, maybe it wasn't as good as we thought. <laughs> or maybe Banalish Marshall is just that good. <laughs> there you go, I like that. You said Marshall's good, right? That was the, Marshall. That's the quote. This is the card, by that's the way. The whenever I am playtesting on play design, I misspell the most often. I'm always building <laughs> these white weenie decks, and I type in Banalish Marshall, and I'm like, why, why, why isn't this submitting? And I always just spell it as your name, and not, <laughs> not you know, with two L's instead of one. It's a tribute. Uh, right, yeah. So it looks like Seth Manfield is going to get in with his two creatures, so a 2-2 two -two lifelink. And now, thanks to the attack trigger there as well, a 4-2. Yeah, I he think can cash in some life if he'd like. I think Luis here might want to trade the Dauntless Bodyguard here with the lifelink token here, okay. as that would make it so Seth would only have two creatures on the battlefield because Luis really doesn't want that Legion's Landing to flip on the following turn. Oh, sure, that can become extraordinarily annoying, especially if he doesn't have an answer for the Banalish Marshal, which you know makes those two two right. uh, lifelinkers, and those are extraordinarily difficult to race it when you're playing mono white. Yeah, and the mono white decks really only have a handful of removal spells. The removal spells that they all play is Conclave Tribunal because it's so powerful mm -hmm. with all these cheap white creatures. And, you know, that'll range from three to four copies. Luis's hand right now, by the way, is two planes, but he does have one copy of each of those powerful three drops that we were wondering if Seth had. Well, Luis has a copy of either, and he can choose to sequence this however he wants. He can play Banalish Marshall now to get in for four in the air, or if he'd like, he can set up a longer game plan with History of Banalia into Banalish Marshall, which is looks like he was going to do here. Yeah, and I wonder if he's going to block. He might. He can probably attack with one of the Falcons, but he's not getting in for a lot because he does have the ability to double block with a 2-2 two -two Knight token and a Rustwing Falcon to put on the Banalish Marshall. Uh, so Seth, you know, it, as long as Luis just keeps two creatures back, Seth will not be able to attack with the Marshall unless he has a second copy in his hand. But he could also be mindful of heroic reinforcements. If Seth goes mountain slam heroic reinforcements, Oof. then that marshal would have been able to attack if Luis attacked with the Rustwing Falcon. Let's take a look at the hand here from Manfield. Does he? Oh, he actually has oh, okay. the reinforcements and a clifftop retreat in hand. Oh, this is a huge, huge turn here. So the question is, does he go for it now, or does he set up aspirant plus knight of grace heroic, re heroic reinforcements next turn for the full on? Yeah, that, that's really, really close because now Luis Salvato will have an extra token next turn and then have the ability to deploy another threat too. So this might be a good opportunity to try to flip that Legion's Landing and get in for a bunch of damage. But given that Luis did not attack with that Rustwing Falcon, Seth actually doesn't really want to attack with Banalish Marshall, even if he plays Heroic Reinforcements because Luis has the ability to triple block and get rid of the, uh, the Marshall that's on the battlefield. Seth with that, uh, you know, f more or less free attack. Luis can choose to save, uh, basically have Seth Manfield lose four life here at the expense of one of his creatures. He's going to do that. Yeah. I mean, those are trade-offs that you have to make occasionally, but probably Seth's pretty excited to see that happen. I mean, that's a lot of material just leaving the battlefield each time. I wonder if Seth wants to disguise the fact that he has the red source. As Heck long yeah. as Seth doesn't have... You know, he, he tops out at four. Look at that. Right. Play it. He, there is no reason to play the Clifftop Retreat showing that you have the red source to play that heroic reinforcements. I love that from Seth. Very cagey, making sure he, his opponent doesn't know what's coming. One little tidbit here as well is that Seth Manfield has three lands, <coughs> five creatures, that's eight. If he plays a land plus heroic reinforcements, he'll get a land plus the extra two creatures. That will give him the city's blessing, and that aspirant will be in the air as well. Right. But this is, you know, Salvato does have, um, you know, that Benelish Marshall in play. So, you know, blocking 
is pretty good with the Rustwing Falcons, but Seth Manfield is going to get in for a ton of damage next turn with that Heroic Reinforcements plus that Clifftop Retreat in his hand. Manfield trying to look as uh, unassuming as possible as he kind of bounces in his chair because, boy, he really gets to flood the board next turn and slam in for a huge amount of damage. It could be the game-winning play. And Luis still needs to put himself in a position to try to win this game, too. So he's just like, look, I'm, if you have heroic reinforcements, you have heroic reinforcements. I'm not going to play around it here. I need, to, I need to get you because the longer this game goes, the higher likelihood that you can do something like that. And here, here it is. is. Clifftop retreat into heroic reinforcements. Two 1-1 one, one white soldiers. All of his creatures are going to get plus one, plus one. And those soldiers get haste as well. So everything's able to attack. And we may just see a massive attack here from Seth Manfield. I'm assuming Seth ran to numbers here, so I'm not going to bother. No, uh, if, <laughs> if if Luis chooses to double uh, to double block the Banalish Marshal to get it off the battlefield, that's still 2, 4, 7. Wait, no, no, no. The one ones are 3 threes because there's Banalish Marshal in place. So I think if he does go for the double block, I think that's just a lethal attack here. He has the city's blessing. And Seth just wants to make sure he's got the numbers correct. But I think, you know, with only two blockers, this is a pretty easy attack with everything. In with everything. Right click, attack all. Math is for blockers, as they say in the business. You figure it out. I'm sending in everything. Remember, he's got multiple, we call them anthem effects, you know, cards that pump up the whole entire team. He's got the heroic reinforcements and then Banalish Marshal pumping everything else. So these creatures are absolutely huge. Three threes at the minimum. Yeah, all of Seth Manfield's creatures get plus two, plus two, and the Banalish Marshal is a four, four. So even if Luis Salvato blocks Seth's two biggest creatures, he will still be taking three, six, 14 damage. Incidentally, if this game does continue for even a couple of more turns, uh, you know, we do have now a, a token factory there for Seth Man Manfield as well. So Luis has to block with both of his creatures. He will lose both of his creatures. So I just don't see how he can get out of this. And there will be basically no favorable blocks. He can't block the Sky Marcher Aspirant as Seth Manfield does have the city's blessing as well. Luis can choose to trade Banalish Marshal with one of the one uh, with one of the tokens, the one ones that are th currently three threes, and he can take fifteen and go to one. Yowza. Yeah, and he's got a couple. Then he'll be left with two Rustwing Falcons <laughs> against the board of Banalish Marshal. Yeah. Flipped Legion's Landing, and like five more creatures. Yeah, probably not going to get there. Mm -mm. No deafening clarions in this list. Right. And I interestingly, though, I, I am fascinated by this because the addition of heroic reinforcements is blowing this game out of the water where, you know, Salvato doesn't have access to that type of card. Yeah. yeah. Some other options that I've seen from just the mono-wide versions is card, are cards like Ajani, Adversary of Tyrants. <laughs> now Seth is forced to do the math. <laughs> he didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you made me do math? Salvato on, did, in fact, block. So <laughs> we're going to have to uh, figure out where Salvato I think this up. is 15 damage, and Luis goes to 1. That's if, if I did it correct. But I'm not 100%. But it looks like 4, 8, 12, plus 3 from the token is 15. Luis goes down to 1, and Luis will lose the Banalish Marshal. Unless somehow there's a hidden black permanent in play. Nope. Then the Knight of Grace would get one additional point of power. Nope, there is not. So block, block, those go away. There is a trade on the battlefield, and uh, Luis Salvato is staring at a pair of trusty Rusty, the Rust with the Falcon, <laughs> and that is not going to be enough not to get the enough. job done here. As you see, the board state for Seth Manfield is completely devastating, and Still he alive. picks up the next game here in our Player of the Year playoff. Now, he's still got a lot of work to do. Salvato's put himself in a beautiful position by being three games to one ahead. As it stands, he's now three games to two. But if Seth, excuse me, if Salvato can just find a win with this deck, he will be the Player of the Year. And once again, Seth Manfield can go here and, uh, I don't know, he can flip a coin or he can pick whichever one he wants. But the bottom line is he needs to beat Seth 
excuse me, beat Luis with both of these decks, not either. So it's kind of like whichever one you want to play now. And keep in mind, now Luis is going to be on the play for both of the games. Because if he loses, the, if he wins the next game, he's the player of the year. If he loses, he gets to go first again. And with this White Weenie deck, I mean, this is going to be putting so much pressure on Seth. Seth needs to win both of these games on the draw against one of the most aggressive decks in the format. All right, let's take a look at the kind of tail of the tape here and see the game-by-game -game results as we've gone. So you see, we actually started off in the mirror, right? So the mono blue tempo for each. Now that was Seth Manfield who ended up winning that one. And then boy, it just fell apart for him. Look at that. Win, win, win. Three in a row there for Salvador to put him up three games to one. Now he just took his second loss. And uh, yeah, we are now sitting here at, at three to two. So yeah, I mean, if you just if you just kind of break it down, yeah, Seth, that, but both players actually playing uh, very, very similar decks here. You know, Luis Salvado with Mono Red, Mono White, Mono Blue, and Jess Guy. And Seth Banfield here with Mono Blue, Mono Red, is it Drake's. And basically, you know, it's a white weenie deck, but it's splashing red for heroic reinforcements. All right, back to the future match area. If you're just joining us, thank you so much for coming along. I know we're a little early. You thought, hey, Pro Tour doesn't start till tomorrow. And you are correct. We are watching the Player of the Year playoff. This is a tie. This is a result of a long feud between these two where Luis Salvato was trying to chase down uh, Seth Manfield over the course of a month, over a month, including stops in Orlando, Los Angeles, Prague, Richmond, Detroit, and Stockholm. So multiple continents involved. And of course, White Weenie. And then we're going to see Mono Red now for Seth. He has two decks left. That's the one that he chose to play. But the truth is he's got to win with both of them as he's going to be player of the year. They tied at the end of the season as far as pro points went, which is unlikely. It's only happened one other time. And now they're facing off against each other to see who it is going to win in this tie-breaking player of the year playoff. We can take a look at the deck list now that we have. Uh, for our two players. This one, of course, is Luis Salvato. We've seen this deck a couple times in a row now because this is his last one. And, and in our format that we're using for this, you have to win one game with each of the decks right. that you brought to the table. And we are playing best of one matches here. So it's just got to win a and game with you each. You know, now this is the matchup, right? Seth Manfield is playing mono red. This is the matchup where Luis's adjustments to his creature base to have less one toughness creatures and play cards like Rustwing Falcon and Snubhorn Sentry is you're really going to see it here because he's going up against the Goblin Chain Whirler deck. Now, he still has a lot of cards that Chain Whirler hits. Don't get me wrong. He still has Aspirant, Dauntless Bodyguard, and Legion's Landing, but you know he doesn't have a card like Healer's Hawk or even a card like Adanto Vanguard. Paying four life to keep it alive against Mono Red is still extremely painful. Mm -hmm, for sure. Like, maybe you can't even pay it, right? right? At some point, you're like, I'm just not willing to pay that much for for one creature on the battlefield to take the one for one. Uh, on the other side of the table, it's Mono Red. Now, look, I look at Lightning Strike, Shock, Lava Coil, and uh, Goblin Chain Whirler, and I'm just feeling like he just is going to have the ability to control the board. Wizards Lightning, I didn't even mention. Yeah. And I know this sounds weird, but he can be the control player here, right? Absolutely. I mean, he's the one with Experimental Frenzy. Right. Mono Red I mean, Control. Goblin Chain Whirler just is such a good blocker, and it deals with a ton of the creatures on, on his side. Now, on top of that, with the addition of Wizards Lightning to the Mono Red deck, this deck is playing 14 burn spells. There's also Fanatical Firebrand, which you can use to deal with some of those cheap creatures. So, you know, Seth has the ability to just kind of use all of his creatures or and, and removal spells to, to keep the aggression at bay. And the fact that Seth Manfield has both Lava Coil, Lightning Strike, and Wizard's Lightning, that means he has 10 ways to deal with, you know, one of the best cards in Luis Salvato's deck, which is that Benalish Marshal. Boy, what an interesting matchup. Somehow, Mono Red Aggro becomes Mono Red Control for Seth Manfield. And I got to say, if I'm sitting in Luis Salvato's seat, I'm starting to feel a little little pressure under the collar there. I mean, look, he was in a, demand, in a commanding position. He was way, way ahead. But if I look at the deck list here, I'm like, I don't like this matchup that much for, for Salvato. Not that he can't win it, but right. it's a best of one, and if I had to guess who has the tools to win, it looks like it's going to be Manfield, which means we could come down to one, and I mean this, game to decide player of the year. My goodness sakes. Yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. You know, one of the things that Luis is really looking for is, we actually haven't seen it in play yet, is the uh, venerated Loxodon. You know, if Luis is on the play and can just 
put a bunch of those X1s in play and then put that Loxodon onto the battlefield before Chain Whirler hits, he can get in for a lot of damage and also blank a lot of the ways that Seth has to interact with Luis's creatures. H how many of the venerated Loxodon did he run? The full Whoa, four copies. All I mean, right. keep in mind, he's playing four Sky Marcher Aspirants, three Legions Landings, four Dauntless Bodyguards, and three Snubhorn Sentries. He's got a ton of one drops in his deck, which allows him to just really just, he could, he could potentially empty out his hand by turn three. You just go one drop, one drop, one drop, one drop, and then the, the Contemplator. Yeah. yeah. And that's interesting, too, because, you know, depending on, on which, which cards you actually end up playing, the 4-4 four four itself is tough to kill, right? Lava Coil is the only thing that reliably kills it. And then, you know, you could make a whole bunch of things that can now dodge a shock or something along those lines and maybe try to outclass the removal that uh, Seth brings to the table. Also, you could just run over Seth, right? Yeah, if, you, you, you know, could just go wide. If he has a draw with, with two Experimental Frenzy or something and you're just like, here's, you know, five two twos and a 4-4, four four, you're probably going to lose Yeah, that Frenzy is one of those cards. It's an extremely powerful card, but very, very bad in multiples. Mm -hmm. They do not do anything for you. And, and Seth is running all of them. So yep. kind of interesting here. Manfield is going to take a mulligan. I'll remind you if you're just joining us that uh, given that we're playing best of one game, we've given the players the option to have a free mulligan. So they can look at their opening seven. If they don't like it, they can mulligan back to seven. Now, they will not be able to scry if they keep that one. But if they continue down the mulligan path and go to six, then they'll scry like any other match. The reasoning for that's pretty straightforward. With so much pressure on each and every game, we wanted to make sure that the players had at least a bit of wiggle room uh, to make sure that it wasn't just a situation where they looked at a, you know, a six land opener or mulligan did, and then boom, they're down to four cards and, right. and it's over. Especially with these kind of mini best of one matchups. Yeah, and this is a pretty subtle touch. I mean, getting a free mulligan is is a big deal, right? I mean, it certainly changes how you think about the game, but also at the same time, it didn't let the players just unleash some nonsense decks, you know, where they, yeah. you know, can mulligan forever or whatever. So. Seth is going to cash in one of those uh, one of those free mulligans right now. And let's see if this is a hand that can tie things up. Or if you're sitting in Salvato's seat, if this is the hand uh, <laughs> that uh Ooh, that's a frenzy. You don't want to see any more. But I, there is two shocks. That's two really shocks good. and a Does frenzy. Three shocks. He has one mountain. mountain. <sighs> two mountains. And maybe the last card is a wizard's lightning. So this is removal heavy with no creatures. Yeah. But he can just go kill your thing, kill your thing, kill your thing, kill your thing, frenzy. I, and honestly, in this matchup, that's kind of what I want. That's what you want to do, right? Just a bunch of removals. Yeah. The only, the, 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 there are two creatures that I like. I don't like the, lo uh, the Lava Runner, but the uh, that's run dead. Runaway Steamkin is huge. Oh, sure. And also the Goblin Chain Whirler. So okay. those are the creatures. You, you don't want the Pyromancer. You don't want the Wizards, basically. Looks like no reason not to fire it off now, but uh, Seth will be shocking this Dauntless Bodyguard at some point here. Down it goes. Seth wants to minimize Luis Salvato's board so he cannot fully maximize the potential of the venerated Loxodon. And he's going to fire another shock off on another Dauntless Bodyguard. There was no second one drop here, though, for Salvato. So we'll see if he has one of the really powerful three mana plays that we talked about. Really, the reasons to play this deck. But Knowledge Marshall's one of them. Yeah. And with, History of Benalia with is the, the other. With the mana that Seth Manfield is, uh, has up, I would much rather have a History of Benalia. And mm -hmm. That's what he's going for here, which is really good against, you know, a handful of shocks. Shock, shock, shock. So three of them in the graveyard already. Manfield does need to make sure he hits his land drop so that he can play that experimental frenzy when the time is right. Right now it's Viachino Pyromancer, and he leaves up a land. He does have a copy of Wizard's Lightning in his hand. Yeah, and I think this is the turn where Luis Salvato plays the Benalish Marshal, uh, given that the History of Benalia will go to Chapter 3 next turn. And Benhalish Marshall is, in fact, a knight. Oh, Ooh, no. he's got double That's trouble here. Way, oh. Luis and Salvato with the combo, <laughs> two yeah, of th those. Th this is kind of the classic draw with the white weenie deck. Anytime, it, you know, it's kind of like old standard when you just drew like multiple siege rhinos, you just felt like you couldn't lose. Whenever you draw multiple history banalias, they just stack on top of each other so well. It just, it feels kind of unfair sometimes. Boy, you know, I thought for a second this is going exactly how Seth uh, wrote it up because Luis also has Benalish Marshall in his hand. I thought he was going to play it. Seth was going to say Wizards Lightning, untap, land, Experimental Frenzy, and try to take over. Instead, it's a much different board state than that. Yeah. Now Seth just wants to empty out his hand, use all the removals. He actually did use that Wizards Lightning end of turn yeah. because I think he wants to set up a situation where he basically, the only way he wants to, he can keep up here is with Experimental Frenzy. So he might be looking to fire that off here. 
But, you know, given the, like, if it had been Benalish Marshall, that would look like a good spot. Now it right. looks like maybe not desperation, but, like, a, a little more on the I hope I get there side than I'm right. feeling great about this. Because those, uh, like you said, the uh, history of Benalias are about to pop off over the course of the next two turns, and they represent a big board state and a lot of damage. Right. Next turn, Seth Manfield's going to take four from the current knight, and then another knight's going to enter the battlefield. And he's going to take more because of right. the Benalish Marshal, right? Yep, so five? <laughs> this is rough. Salvato oh. with a key draw here. He has the two copies of History of Benalia. Oh, and another Marshal. Whoa! The three drops, of course, are what's important in this deck, and he has a chance here to play four of them in a row and just devastate Seth Manfield's chances here. Oh, this is a huge turn. Take a look at this. He's also got a Conclave Tribunal in hand. The Knight tokens have Vigilance, oh, so he's going to be able to play Marshall into Tribunal goodness. on Seth's only chance to actually come back in this game. This is huge for Luis Salvato. He is on the verge, perhaps, of winning Player of the Year after hunting down Seth Manfield. GP after GP after GP, scrapping it out until the last possible chance. And now he has a devastating board state against Seth Manfield. He ended up having to waste his entire last turn after losing the experimental frenzy off the board. And here is oh. history of Benalia once again doing its thing. That's chapter three, pumping up the squad. And guess what? There's more. Another. Benalish Marshall hits the battlefield. And these creatures are huge. Gigantic. Remember, Panalish Marshall's also a knight, so it gets the ability off of Chapter 3. The tokens are 6 fives, and the Benalish Marshall is also a 6 five. Oh my goodness sakes. Just, ca just casual 18 damage. Sal Salvato laying the beats down here in what looks to be our last game of our Player of the Year playoff. He has gone with full-on... Benalish Marshall times two, history of Benalia times two, and he's developed a massive board against this mono red deck. Looks like he doesn't want to offer the Benalish Marshall up for some type of trade, so he's just going to attack with the two knights and try to set up a two-turn kill. Yeah, so in this situation, Luis is playing as conservatively as possible because he knows that it's so unlikely for him to lose this game, so he wants to keep his Benalish Marshalls uh, at four toughness. By having a pair on the board, they'll both be pumping each other up, meaning that Seth Manfield can't use his three damage burn spells to get them off the board. What is this? Oh, oh and my he's got goodness. Venerated locks it on post combat as well, just in case you wondered how ahead he was. He's all the way ahead, a long journey for Luis Salvato, and can he finish the job? It looks trivial from this point. Seth Manfield down to three. He passes the turn back to Salvato, draws his card, doesn't even look at it, sends in the team, and we have a player of the year. It's Luis Salvato. Salvato. And here comes his teammates wow. to congratulate him. I mean, this is just the culmination of an amazing journey, grinding for seven straight weeks, traveling from Orlando to LA to Prague to Richmond to Detroit, then to Stockholm just to put himself in this spot to become the player of the year. That's another check mark on his MTG Pro bucket list. And it took that last trip to Stockholm for him to get here. He needed to top eight the GP. He somehow found a way to do so. And then he had to sit across from Seth Manfield, one of the greatest players in our game today, and beat him and Luis Salvato. Wow, he really just cements himself as an all-timer here. He is now a Pro Tour champion and a player of the year. That's the kind of resume stuff that is just top, top bill. And uh, congratulations to Luis Salvato. What an incredible victory laying the beat down, too, that was, with that some was of his savage. most powerful stuff. And it uh, looked like a pretty good draw for Manfield, but not even close. He didn't have the type no. of uh, firepower to keep up there. All right, looks like we've got Tim Willoughby down on the floor with our Player of the Year, Luis Salvato. Wow, Luis. Did it in style there in that last game. It felt to me like when you drew so many of the powerful three drops that white weenie deck that it was just kind of 
destined to happen, but it's been a big year for you to get here. There was a lot of chasing. I mean, that trip to Sweden, it didn't necessarily <laughs> seem like a great idea when you first went to Stockholm looking for those last points, but now all of those choices vindicated. Firstly, congratulations on locking up Player of the Year, but secondly, just talk me through what was going through your head in that last game when you saw that opening hand. I was uh, thinking, okay, let's avoid planes and let's get some good cards. <laughs> it was like Luxor, Luxor, Luxor. And well, when I drew the second Menalia, I knew that the game was close to over. And I didn't see my last draw, but I didn't need anything, so it was a blast. Now, of course, Player of the Year, there can only ever be one in each year. You're a part of a very, very elite club now. What does being Player of the Year mean to you? Well, it's, it's, I think it's a... I got rewarded because I play a lot and I got some good results and I learned a lot in all this year. And finishing this way is, like, insane. I mean, like I said before, it's one of the best accomplishments, like... Winning a Pro Tour, I won a Pro Tour. Uh, that was just insane. The NBA Player of the Year. Um, well, seems like I only need the third one. It's like the world, win the World Championship, but it can wait. <laughs> so it's insane. There's still time for you to become the world champion here. But for now, well, I think the celebrations might be going on late into the night for our new Player of the Year as he gets things ready for Pro Tour. Guilds of Ravnica, congratulations again, our Player of the Year.